very warm welcome on behalf of the FINAX committee and the first PGDF EXUEL badge of XLIRI Jamshedpur for the discussion on Union Budget 2023, Decoding Budget and Beyond. And to decode the critical takeaways from the budget announcements and to understand the key drivers of India's economic growth ahead, I'm excited to present our very first uh, panel discussion on lubricating India's economic growth engines uh, from a very macro perspective. So our first, first uh, panelist is Mr. Uh, is Professor N. R. Bhanumurti. So Professor Bhanumurti is the Vice Chancellor of B. R. Ambedkar School of Economics, University, Bangalore. He has served on uh, over 22 government committees constituted by the Finance Ministry, Ministry of Statistics, Ministry of Rural Development, National Statistical Commission, Erstwhile Planning Commission, Niti Aayog, RBI, and the government of Karnataka, among others. Dr. Bhanumurti has been the Secretary of Indian Econometric Society since 2006 and the Managing Trustee of the Indian Economic Association uh, Trust for Research and Development since 2010. He has also received two prestigious awards, the Mahalanubis Memorial Award for the year 2014 and VKRV Rao Prize in Social Science for the year 2015. Uh, we welcome you, sir. Yeah, thank you. Uh, next, uh, we have Dr. Sachidanan Shukla. He is the Chief Economist of Mahindra Group. He has around 20 years of experience spanning capital markets and financial services. Prior to joining the Mahindra Group, he was associated with Access Capital, which was earlier known as ENAM, as Chief Economist. His key research areas have been financial markets, strategy, development policy, program implementation, and impact evaluation. He has a PhD in financial economics from Villa Institute of Technology and postgraduate qualifications in business management, finance, and economics from the University of Mumbai. He has been the recipient of KJ Sumaya Gold Medal. We welcome you, sir. Uh, welcome to the session. And uh, as the moderator, we have our beloved faculty, Dr. H.K. Pradhan, the program director of PGTF. He is the professor of finance and economics in XLRI Jamshedpur with an experience for more, uh, of more than you know 35 years of teaching. He has also served as a member of RBI Technical Advisory Committee on Financial Markets, an independent director of the State Bank of India Mutual Fund, a director on the board of Micro Credit Rating International Limited, and a member of Index and Option Committee of NCDEX Mumbai. He was the Pacific Regional Advisor for the Commonwealth Secretariat London, while serving concurrently as the Residential Debt Advisor with the Ministry of Finance Government of Fiji Islands. He served as a debt advisor for several Commonwealth countries, acted as an ex Support for the United Nations in the Finance for Development Initiative, drafted the framework papers for the Doha meet of the UN ES CAP, acted as the consultant to the uh, you know, Asian Development Bank on Municipal Finance and to the Crown Agents London uh, on debt management. And uh, I, uh, we welcome you, sir, and so honored that you are uh, you know, moderating this panel. And so, uh, have we all, uh, so Mr. Rajiv, has he also joined? He, he would be joining, I suppose. Okay, so, so uh, no issue. Uh, okay, no issue, sir. So I. Yes. Okay, so uh, so uh, with this, I think, uh, Pradhan, sir, you can take on and uh, you can start with this uh, enlightening session. Yeah, thank you, Sima. And uh, I was uh, 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 students when they tell you beloved professor, I'm sure they go by the grades you submit. <laughs> 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 and. Uh, but uh, so kind of you to have such a lengthy introduction. Uh, I think I realized that I need to update my CV. The, these, these are my old CV. <laughs> so currently I do nothing except cheating. Um, and really great to have you, uh, Professor Banmurti and uh, Prof. Dr. Shukla and Rajiv will join us. Uh, and uh, we thank you all the time. You support us uh, for XLRI event. And so we have two panels. The first one is more a macro perspective. And, and the second one is uh, a bit macro and uh, financial markets. Uh, so this is, uh, this is about, uh, I think if we have, we have spent almost 10 minutes and uh, we, we have uh, now around 50 minutes uh, left. And so, so, so I, I think they, by now the press, uh, media, everybody, uh, is all uh, you know praise for the budget uh, pragmatic uh, someone says not populist 
across spectrum, the, the, the corporate India have all held the budget, a bold, beautiful, and I, I, I saw someone from the uh, mutual fund industry says Bahubali. So, uh, so we we it's, there's so much of praise for this. I think uh, Rajiv ji has already joined us. So welcome, uh, Rajiv ji, uh, Rajiv Radhakrishnan, the chief investment officer of uh, SPI Mutual Fund. Welcome you, Rajiv ji. And uh, so, uh, uh, so this uh, I I suppose uh, the general perception is that the budget is well crafted. And, uh, and titbits appears addressing almost every all concerns. There is focus on growth, there is focus on public infrastructure, the fiscal consolidation path is well underway. There is a large push to capital expenditure, tax relief to middle income class. Uh, I think it came after a long time, there was anticipation and a focus on manufacturing <coughs> sector, the push on digital economy. Uh, and and uh, to some extent inclusive, uh, there are areas where the budget addresses MSME, uh, rural India, agriculture, green growth and energy transition. So therefore, it appears uh, generally people talk now the budget had stick, tick, tick, everything else that was in the agenda. Uh, the backdrop is uh, I, I would like to have from the panel. I think, I think the economy has recovered from their pandemic low. And uh, whether it is growth, is investment, the credit offtake, uh, capacity utilization, and all parameters, I think the economy has well recovered uh, pre, uh, back to the pre-pandemic periods, uh, levels of GDP and uh, all, all parameters may be better in some area. We have been very successful in the vaccination drives, unlike many countries, including China, even some of the Western economies and all uh, the contact uh, intensive sectors have recovered. And, uh, and in some sectors, uh, even the momentum has achieved very well. And uh, uh, the, the budget, uh, I suppose the budget provides the, the fiscal support uh, in many ways to agriculture and rural economy, tourism, and they are all uh, needed for more employment job creations and uh, the, the priority to agriculture and uh, rural economy uh, uh, are, are actually uh, very much needed and uh, micro and small enterprises. So I would, uh, I would request the panelists to dwell a bit on how inclusive uh, uh, the budget is. The capital expenditure goes by a hoofing 33%. I think we have to decode this number, the center state and the different forms of capital formation. Uh, the middle class, as I said, like the tax rebate, which increased from five lakhs to seven lakhs, benefit of standard deduction for salaried class and pensioners a bit, uh, in terms of uh, the size of uh, the savings that they can put it up. Uh, so we can see some some increase in the disposable income in the hands of uh, consumers. If the, the finance minister. Uh, again, reiterates the envisions of the Amrit Kal, that is 25 years leading up to 100 years of independence. And I think, I think they are they are very uh, interesting uh, observations uh, made uh, in the budget. We look forward. Uh, so, uh, without much ado, let me turn to uh, Professor Banumurthy first. Uh, Professor Banumurthy, the budget basically used to be a government balance sheet. Uh, over time, and you being a professor uh, in public finance, I think uh, uh, Seema forgot to mention Professor Vanumurti is a distinguished professor of uh, public finance in the National Institute of Public Finance and Policy, New Delhi, a think tank in public finance. But budget increasingly is becoming a framework for growth and, and macro strategies, financial strategy. Uh, the finance minister uh, keeps the budget medium term growth at the center stage of uh, fiscal policy. And, uh, and, and one can see that uh, that has been uh, for the last, uh, uh, at least for the last two years. And uh, the numbers the government have been meeting, whatever budget estimates, the actuals and the projections, I think they are synchronized, uh, appears to be. And uh, so qu my question is that, uh, are the fiscal maths uh, credible? And uh, are there uh, or there are any areas where, uh, where the consolidation path may drift away? Uh, Professor Banmurti, over to you. 
Yeah, thank you, Dr. Pradhan, and um, thank you, XLRI, for inviting me to this uh, panel discussion. It's always a pleasure to be part of XLRI's uh, programs. I don't know if this may be our fifth or sixth event that I'm participating. Uh, I mean, I think physically I have participated in many programs, and this is the first one I'm participating online. Um, so with regard to the budget, um, Dr. Pradhan, I think, um, so I think touch wood that we are here for after uh, COVID-19, um, you know, we have a kind of a medium -term macro fiscal framework. Um, I hope that will continue for some more time uh, before somebody comments and criticizes this particular path. Um, and usually we know that budgets take a very short term view. And, um, you know, we look only for uh, how to attract more uh, political economy gains. But uh, I think there is a structural change the way budgets are made, uh, not really focusing, not hitting the galleries, um, you know, not hitting the headlines. So even this time, despite so many good things, uh, somebody else has grabbed the headlines next day, right? So, so in that sense, um, we would like to see this more of a, a medium term policy document and added to that, you know, <clears throat> in the absence of planning commission, in the absence of any other fiscal council, uh, only place that is left for medium term policy is the budget. So, so despite the, you know, being a last budget before the general election, I think the government has taken a very bold view that it should be a document meant for the medium term perspective. Uh, so that's something which um, you know I have been raising it for almost 10 to 12 years. So I'm glad that uh, I'm personally happy with this for many reasons. Um, one, because it is a medium term document. Two, I think there is a credibility of the fiscal numbers. Most of the numbers. In fact, many times we were told that uh, you know the finance minister is actually uh, downplaying some of the achievements in terms of the fiscal numbers. Uh, the way they have, um, you know, conservatively fixed the nominal GDP growth last year and the way they did that this year as well. I think they want to yeah, aim low but hit at a higher higher level. So I think that that certainly looks very, very uh, happy situation. In terms of the fiscal consolidation, um, of course, um, I think um, the students, those who are here, I'm, I must tell you that um, please, um, please, uh, you know, Please believe me when I say uh, that um, uh, I have been doing this EFRB roadmap for the three finance commission, 13th, 14th, and 15th finance commission. And please believe me that when we say fiscal consolidation is not a fiscal compression strategy, it is a com expenditure switching strategy from revenue to capital. And I think that's what really happened in this budget also. And for the first time after a long, very long time, we are seeing in the fiscal deficit. Uh, the capital expenditure share is larger than the revenue deficit. Um, again, I'm I'm seeing the finance students are here. When you say fiscal deficit, fiscal deficit is equal to revenue deficit plus capital expenditure, right? So if you have 5.9 is the target, 3% uh, is the capital expenditure, 2.9 is the revenue deficit. And this is the first time it happened where capex share is larger than the revenue deficit, and it goes very well for medium term growth strategy. Why should the government focus more on capital expenditure? And again, comes back to the, the philosophy of the FRBN, where you know when you are shifting the expenditure from revenue to capital, uh, you will have a larger growth for a simple reason that the multipliers for the capital expenditure is larger than the revenue expenditure. Now, uh, the government, the, in fact, it's there in the economic survey also, and also in, in the last two budgets, and also in this budget as well, where the capex multiplier is 2.45, when you say 2.45, if you're spending one rupee on capex, you should get a minimum of 2.45 output. When it comes compared to the revenue expenditure, uh, where you are spending one rupee on revenue expenditure, actually you get less than one rupee uh, 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 from the output. So somebody can ask what happens to the rest of the rupee. Basically, that becomes a leakage in the economy. That is, the imports will will be increasing if you have a larger revenue expenditure, but there is no support from the government. From the domestic uh, sector so the 2.45 number is actually my number right i mean uh, this is the based on my study which was in 2013 i was surprised to see the you know um i mean this study has stayed for a long time 
but I, but at the same time, I would like to say that 2.45 is not a sacrosanct number. But if you estimate now, it will be slightly bigger or larger. In fact, last month I did one study and it's published in EPW where I say that when the economy is actually going down, in fact, the multiplier size are larger than when the economy is in the normal period. So, so, so you know, the point we are saying is that um, at the fiscal consolidation roadmap um, uh, that government has achieved, maybe it looks good, but I thought um, they're still not really achieving what the original FRB mapped of 2003 for the third consecutive year. This is only a small grudge I have with the budget that uh, the third consecutive year, I think the government has actually shied away from, from presenting um, uh, a consolidation roadmap for the next year. They just said that uh, they would like to achieve 4.5% by the end of 25-26, but they still don't bring that revenue deficit as a target variable. Okay? If you look at the 2018 Amendment Act, they removed the revenue deficit as a target variable, so they have only fiscal deficit and public debt. But ultimately, I think as students, those who are here, I think we should focus more on the public debt to GDP ratio. That is the medium term anchor for us, not just fiscal deficit or the revenue deficit. So how to reduce the public debt to GDP ratio is something that we have to focus. And again, why should we reduce the public debt to GDP ratio? It is because you know, every year you have to pay interest payments. You have to service that public debt. Right now, it's almost close to 50% of the total revenue that is going for interest payment. So obviously, if there is an increase in the interest payment, somewhere you have to cut your expenditures either on social sector or on, on, on uh, the capital expenditure. So, so I think the medium term, if at all, the government comes back with a medium term fiscal strategy, I think the public should, debt should be the core of, of the public policy. So I'll stop here. Maybe I can come back later. Uh, no, thank you, Professor Bhanavati. Just a quick, uh, uh, it's, I'm just curious, uh, not, not as an economist, but I'm asking this question as a, as a simple layman. Uh, see, okay, the budget, uh, the, the Indian fiscal deficit targets, fiscal deficit was 3.4% in FY19 and 4.7% in FY20. <clears throat> Uh, but if you see now, of course, bearing those COVID dates, uh, 5.9, it, it, it's a little higher. 4.7 in uh, uh, now, 20, FY20, now it is 5.9. But, but you look at the macro parameters of this high fiscal deficits. Inflation is well under control, despite the large liquidity bulge. And uh, so, so I'm just saying that uh, given the economy thrust on consumption and the growth that I think Dr. Sukla would uh, come back to consumption. I have read him writing on that, promoting consumption. Uh, so what, what, why not we keep this a bit uh, fiscal relaxations uh, uh, and the monetary policy is taking care of uh, the liquidity, I think very well. Uh, so we haven't seen a much spillover to balance supplement as well. The, if there are export growth falling, it's because of the global demand. Uh, much is, I, I suppose, the global oil, global demand, and all of these factors. So is it, uh, does it make sense? I agree with you that we need to have a cap on the debt GDP ratio because that puts your revenue deficit interest burden. Uh, but then uh, most of our debt is, to, is uh, to domestic. So they also promote the benefits to the economy in terms of government security, institutional investments, etc. So, so I'm saying that is there a leg room by the, not to be so overtly conscious about this fiscal deficit? No, no, I think um, you're right. Um, you know, um... It doesn't matter what is the fiscal deficit is. I mean, generally, I'm taking a view, different view here, but it matters what is the composition of the fiscal deficit, right? I mean, if you take a simple uh, national income identity where you have y equal to c plus i plus g plus x minus m, it doesn't matter whether you're increasing i component or the g component. Obviously, the aggregate demand will go up, right? What is important is what is the long-term implications of if you go the G route or if you go with the I route, I think that's what is important. No, but now even the 5.9% is very high, come as you rightly pointed out. But if the large part of that is actually going for I component, so it actually balances the nominal GDP growth uh, between inflation and real GDP growth. So any increase in the nominal GDP growth, if it leads to real GDP growth, there is no problem. 
but any increase in nominal gdp growth leads to inflation or leads to the leakage in the current account deficit is something very serious for us so i think um, i keep telling that is the reason i just uh, alluded to that we need to return back to the original frb act of 2003 where the revenue deficit should be equal to zero it doesn't matter what is the fiscal deficit okay Absolutely. if if you have that kind of a strategy then only your public debt to gdp ratio will come down public debt gdp ratio is basically if you want to bring it down increase in the numerator should be lower than the increase in the denominator right so, so until then i am fine but if you say that increase in numerator is larger than the increase in the denominator then it will create um, intergenerational issues and um, of course our young people don't bother how much public debt we are generating right now because they are busy in many other things but but i think we need to focus on this if you want to really have a sustainable growth for uh, for the next 10 to 15 years no oh, sure thank you and i think i am eager to turn to rajiv a little later i'm sure he would have a lot of points on this uh, debt debt markets yields etc looking from a market perspective dr sukla over to you now uh, just to put a little more to macro perspective now uh, i think uh, Prof. Manmuthi states that as long as you have revenue expenditure shifting towards capex is very good, and there is a big the thrust on capex. First of all, this number, and uh, and then how does it uh, work around the manufacturing sector? I think India needs now to strengthen the manufacturing sector, even for the sustaining the growth and uh, as well as employment. and we have also seen that the addition the railway is also highest ever capital outlay of 2.4 lakh crore uh, uh, i think a nine time increase uh, i was reported uh, i have seen that over the last 10 years uh, so considering this capex momentum and uh, its growth impulse specifically to manufacturing sector dr shukla could you reflect a little on this um thank you uh, dr pradhan uh, thank you xlri for having me um i think uh, dr bhanumurthy has made some very important points to begin this uh, entire conversation with uh yes completely agree uh, that the capex thrust that, that this government has shown uh i i think is exemplary uh if you are going to spend more on capital expenditure as compared to revenue expenditure qualitatively it is better because of the multipliers and and things like that let me now where uh uh risk management hat and and try and explain this so while it is very good for the medium term qualitatively it is better and and let me state this that this is for the first time in our fiscal history i guess and dr banumurthy can correct me if i'm wrong uh that four years in a row capital expenditure has continued to move up substantially right we we've, we've not had four uninterrupted years of capital expenditure really going up so yes this is this is a great qualitative shift uh, but let me now come to real life issues and and very near term so let's look at fy24 uh, when you look at the revenue expenditure and capital expenditure let me give some numbers for the students to understand the government is trying to spend about 45 lakh crore this year right uh, and of that revenue expenditure stood at 34.6 lakh crore and that is going to go up only by 40000 crore in a year right in in fy24 and this is just about 1.2% yy growth if i take out interest expenditure interest payments uh, that dr banumurthy spoke about it's almost 10 lakh crore uh, equivalent to the the capital expenditure uh, that we're talking about if i adjust for that revenue expenditure is actually degrowing 4% right in a year where capital expenditure is slated to grow by more than 30% now uh, students will find it slightly confusing that economists and and government and most people look at it in in different ways if you adjust for say uh, state government expenditure public sector expenditure so there are multiple ways of looking at it but there is there is no i mean uh, no uh, difference of opinion in the sense that capital expenditure is is going to go up in in a big way so whichever way you slice and dice the point is capital expenditure is going to go uh, go up significantly what matters to businesses on the ground and people feeling better 
right? Is also the fact that the revenue expenditure is 35 lakh crore out of 45 lakh crore, right? And if you degrow that number, there will be pockets of pain or there will be implications on the ground for certain businesses that, that operate either in on the rural side or, or the urban side. So basically the point I'm making is the multiplier effects will kick in over the medium term. And it also depends on the ability to execute from the central government point of view. Uh, we have seen the government really execute fantastically over the last two decades on, on the road side. Uh, but we haven't really seen the same uh, when it comes to railways, for example, uh, right? Or there could be pockets where there is a difference. So I'm, I'm not really haggling on the government's ability to execute. They, they have actually shown uh, a big, uh, say, uptick in, in their ability to spend big on, on certain items. But if you look at the revenue expenditure, uh, where is that coming from? So the way India has done fiscal consolidation, typically in, in the past is, Whenever you had to bring down the deficit, you cut capital expenditure. So which compromised your quality, uh, which compromised your medium term quality of growth. Now what we're doing is exactly the opposite. We are cutting down revenue expenditure. And I think this is really a, a bold budget in the sense, uh, there are two things that have happened. One, they have cut revenue expenditure in an electorally sensitive year. So we had nine state elections and the general election. I haven't seen the government resort to a 4% cut in the revenue expenditure. So for, for the benefit of students, a revenue expenditure is three and a half times larger than the capital expenditure. Uh, it gets spent here and now during the course of the fiscal year, whereas the capital expenditure will have the benefits over time, right? Uh, the the uh, multiplier that Dr. Bhanumurthy spoke of, or there are multiple studies, basically those kick in over a period of time, say three to four years. But the revenue expenditure can bite you during the course of this fiscal year. And wh what I uh, mean by that is, for example, uh, if the monsoon were to fail, so if there is a uh, domestic accident, if the monsoon is erratic, and SkyMet has come up with, with an early scare saying the second half of the monsoon can, can be a problematic. The government will have to very quickly reorient expenditure. Or there is a global accident. So the Ukraine-Russia uh, war intensifies or there are these uh, tense situations between uh, US and China, China-Taiwan and, and multiple such uh, geopolitical, geoeconomic issues. Iran and Israel can be a flashpoint. If any of those accidents, whether global or domestic, happen uh, with a 4% cut in revenue expenditure, which is, say, 35 odd lakh crore, you don't have many degrees of freedom. So your near-term growth can be compromised. But, but I think kudos to, to this uh, government. They have actually resorted to a big, significant cut on the revenue expenditure in an electorally sensitive uh, year. Also... I don't remember really seeing the government in the last at least 30 years that have been looking at these budgets cut or uh, sorry, cut um, or, or provide relief to the highest income earners. So when was the last time we saw that in an electorally sensitive year, right? Uh, so people who earn more than five crores, they've been handed out a 10% relief on, on tax, right? Uh, I, I think this is very counterintuitive. All of us have been conditioned to think that government will dole out something. They will actually uh, hurt the rich and spend it on the poor. Actually, it's not happened this year. So I'm, I'm telling you about the revenue expenditure. I'm telling you about how the government has given a, a big relief to the highest income segment. So that, that speaks volumes about the, the ability and the confidence of, of the government. But having said all of that, I, I still think uh, that if there were some domestic accident, uh, the government will be uh, facing a severe uh, issue in terms of quickly reorienting expenditure. So what happens to fertilizer prices if Russia-Ukraine war intensifies or something happens to oil? Um, we don't have the numbers budgeted over there. So I, I think this is something that we need to watch out for. So basically the point I'm making is just with about 2 trillion additional uh, spending, the government is budgeting for a 29 trillion increase in nominal GDP growth. I, I think that is very aggressive. Basically, it all boils down to a single trick pony. If we are unable to execute on CAPEX, 
or if state governments do not really spend as much. So for example, as we speak, 10 of the largest states have spent only 38, 39% of the budgeted number on CAPEX. So if that doesn't happen, and, and for the benefit of students, states put together are larger than what the central government spends. So they ultimately impact the outcome of the, these CAPEX uh, uh, plans and outcomes. So I, I think this is a single trick pony and very, very tricky in terms of executing during the year. Uh, Dr. Pradhan, you asked me about uh, manufacturing. I think prima facie, when you look at the um, allocations, seems that the government has probably not focused as much on, on manufacturing. But I, I think what the government is trying to do is they are betting big on, on CAPEX. And I said it, it's almost like a single trick pony. But if you do that via roads, railways, and CAPEX, you will be creating demand for industrial intermediates, right? Or intermediate uh, segment. Uh, that could be steel, cement, and, and a whole host of things. So there is an indirect push or support given to, to manufacturing. Um, and I think uh, what also uh, is, is very important is they're reorienting. For the first time, they not mentioned roads in, in the budget speech. And we're moving towards railways, which is better from carbon emission uh, perspective, et cetera. And I think manufacturing, a lot has been done already uh, on the sidelines and they continue to do so. Uh, ease of doing business, for example, nearly 40,000 compliances have been removed. Hundreds of laws have been removed. Uh, these are archaic laws. Uh, and we are seeing increased digitalization, faster settlement of tax disputes, all of these will add to competitive manufacturing from, from India. So I, I think the real uh, uh, place to watch this manufacturing story is not inside the budge budget, but outside the budget as to how the government really supports this. And just for the benefit of students, even a small manufacturing company, why this ease of doing business? Why am I talking about compliances? If you have a, one single plant and a, less than 500 employees, you have 750 compliances to deal with, right? 60 acts of the government, and these are central and state government. There are 23 licenses. And if you move on to become a mid-sized manufacturing company with six plants, you are regulated by more than 5,500 compliances, right? 135 acts, 98 licenses. And, and these keep changing during the year. So I think the point I'm making is while the government has done something on fame for automobiles, some custom duty rejig, etc. I think it is all of these things that are working parallelly, which will impart competitiveness to the Indian manufacturing sector. So I'll stop there. Back to you, Dr. Pradhan. No, thank you. Very interesting, uh, very interesting observation, data. Uh, I just uh, quickly, two, three observations. A, I think Nitin Gadkari has been very successful in mobilizing roads. So therefore, now they, this moves to Aswini Vaishnav for Indian railways. Uh, and I think railway needs uh, more investment, more greening, green uh, oriented uh, investment, uh, emissions, etc. So that is one. And, uh, and I think, I think this, uh, this government has, uh, you know, it, as far as expenditure is concerned, uh, the entire COVID period tells us that we were not like uh, other economies, we're trying to throw a helicopter money. Uh, the government was careful. The expenditures were, were targeted to a significant extent, and uh, and I think they were all uh, the 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 way the PLI came, the production linked uh, approach came. I think the government was careful in terms of not really uh, doling out a lot in the expenditure side, even the worst of the time during the COVID. And uh, I, I, I was a little surprised. I think maybe I think that's what the tone of your conversations. If I uh, so that there was a relief for HNI. Uh, maybe a little more relief could have come to the middle class uh, rather than going towards the high income. I think the pandemic has shifted the distribution, uh, tilted uh, the, the Gini coefficients towards the, uh, you know, the, the HNI and, and the high income group and people who made uh, investments uh, in, 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 in markets. Uh, so therefore, uh, that uh, I do not know whether that's the right way of thinking. Uh, yes, yes, Indian income tax tax rates are high compared to global. Uh, but I thought that HNI was a little, uh, you know, the, uh, it was unexpected. It came. Um, uh, yeah. So, so thank you very much. Would you like to comment on that, or would we turn to Rajiv? 
No, so just uh, I, I'm I'm not uh, picking a point or or uh, really nitpicking. Uh, all I'm saying is, we were all uh, expecting that the government will have some populism, something. They have completely avoided that, sidestepped that, and it it shows the confidence of the government. Uh, typically, we have seen these surcharges increase and then people learning about say 50 lakhs first and then about uh, over a crore and all of that. And globally, this has been the, the, the theme, right? You tax the rich and try and distribute, redistribute. I think last 30 years, at least I cannot, I don't recall a, a situation where the, the highest end of income taxpayers has been given a 10% relief. That shows the degree of confidence this government has. Please remember, the government cut corporate tax rates. And, and why I'm making these points is, there has been stigmatization of capital in this country, right? Um, it, it's, I think it's a big, big move. To me, you are showing confidence in people who can earn uh, on, on merit. Uh, corporates are the real engines of growth, right? So for all this talk about public capex, only 5% of it is, if I combine central government and state government uh, capital expenditure, it is just about 5% of GFCF. So for students, I mean, this is the total... Capex, I mean, in, in a way, and the government contributes barely that much. It is the private sector that creates jobs. It is the private sector that contributes to, to growth in a sustainable way. So in a year or two, it is very good that, that you need to prop up because uh, the, the private sector is not confident enough. But I think this is a big move. It, it shows that we are now destigmatizing capital. Those who earn high, are not necessarily bad people. So that's the limited point. I mean, let I, I didn't want people to misunderstand what I'm saying. Now that's well appreciated. Thank you, Dr. Sukla. So now I over to uh, Rajiv ji, uh, the big picture on borrowing uh, and, and, and the interest rate market. Uh, now the government uh, gross borrowing is 15.4 trillion and the net borrowing is 11.8. The balance, the difference of course is going towards repayment. And uh, I think, I think was this a better than what the spread was expecting in terms of government borrowings? And, uh, and the, your overall impression on, 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 on the borrowing math and the implication on, on the market? Yeah, good afternoon, sir. Uh, hope you can hear me. I'm... Yes, loud. Yeah, okay. Uh, so you did mention about uh, you know, the market expectation and its uh, implication. So, uh, getting into the budget, the market uh, expectation on the gross borrowing number would, uh, would was around uh, 16, uh, 16 trillion. Uh, so any number that was, uh, that if it had been higher than that, the market could have taken it negatively and slightly better than that, of course, the market has taken positively. So as you said, uh, rightly, the gross number has come at 15.4, which is uh, uh, much lower than uh, uh, market expectations. So the immediate impact in terms of market has been uh, positive because uh, bond markets uh, were fearing a slightly uh, larger number uh, getting into the budget. So, but again, uh, there is, so when you look at the uh, overall uh, uh, fiscal deficit on an absolute basis, about 17 or trillion uh, dollars, uh, sorry, 17 uh, odd uh, trillion rupees, and when you look at the funding of it, roughly 70% of that is funded through net market borrowings, which is the number that you mentioned, slightly around uh, 12 trillion uh, rupees. And the balance comes uh, predominantly from the public account, that is a small savings collection. Uh, so th that, that's a key number, that 12 trillion net market borrowing that has to be uh, uh, funded by the bond market. And that is something that is very important uh, from market direction uh, perspective. Uh, uh, what we need to see is uh, at the same time, uh, this year, uh, the budgeted uh, number from the uh, small savings kitty is about 4.7, roughly, I think 4.7 trillion or so. So that is an element uh, that needs to, because, you know, what is effectively small savings uh, does it, at a margin, it competes with bank fixed deposits. So we have seen in the recent past that the banking system has actually seen a significant amount of pickup in the credit side, credit offtake, but deposit growth has been lagging. But at the margin, deposit rates have actually started to be uh, pushed up by most of the banks. So uh, the small savings rates need to be seen in that context. So there were a few announcements in the budget, uh, which in a way will incentivize the uh, small savings collections as well. So one is uh, the senior citizen savings scheme, uh, which they have doubled the amount 
that people can put from 15 to 30. Uh, if you recollect, the rates on senior citizen savings scheme is 8%. Uh, they are indexed to government securities, but the indexation typically happens with a lag. It does not need you know, uh, uh, materially float alongside the market interest rate. So my sense is that 8% and the doubling of the small saving uh, limit, the senior citizen scheme, is a material uh, change, which will potentially lead to uh, uh, flows uh, uh, probably even higher than 4.7 that has been budgeted. So uh, aside from that, they have announced one more uh, scheme uh, targeted at women, uh, two year at uh, seven and a half. That probably will compete with the bank deposits, but they have been uh, enough uh, announcement to sort of incentivize the small savings collections as well. So overall, uh, uh, from market perspective, I think this is a number that can be absorbed. Uh, the trajectory of yields very clearly as we go forward will again be a function of monetary policy dynamics and where uh, the inflation uh, 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 inflation outlook is likely to uh, go. And from that perspective, uh, the next week we have the RBI MPC. Uh, there have been a few other uh, global monetary policy announcements recently, global central bank. So the direction of market bond deals uh, as we go forward, now that the budget is out of the way, the event risk is over. The budget numbers are fairly comfortable uh, from market perspective. Uh, but very clearly, the additional element that is important to uh, uh, figure or rather to uh, analyze would be where the monetary policy cycle uh, uh, goes. Uh, we think that we are close to the peak in terms of uh, monetary uh, tightening in India. Uh, the review uh, next week probably uh, takes the policy rate to six half, and then we potentially could see a long period of pause. Uh, so going forward, the outlook on interest rates is far uh, uh, sanguine than what we were a uh, year back because the monetary uh, tightening has, uh, uh, has substantially, I think, uh, you know, gone uh, up in the last seven, eight months. Uh, policy rates are close to peak. There is, of course, an element of uh, inflation risk in terms of, you know, there can be potential flashpoints, whether it is geopolitics or if Chinese demand starts to revive. But broadly, given that monetary policy has uh, undertaken a lot of measures over the last uh, eight, nine months, including interest rate tightening and more importantly, liquidity absorption, I think we are close to the peak in terms of uh, interest rates uh, in this cycle. Uh, so so what, uh, what I see from you is that A... Uh, the market has uh, liked a little lower than what was expected in the government borrowing program. and But then there is a little tweak towards the small savings. So they would like to tap that segment. Uh, I think that uh, uh, I think th that's a debate, you know, which, which way we attract savings uh, in an economy because our savings are below around 30%, below 29.9 or whatever. I think we need to lift the savings. Historically, it is very low. And uh, any encouragement to small savings are always desirable. But for the government, uh, I think uh, the, the, the borrowing, I, I suppose more borrowing, market-based borrowing is always better rather than this administered interest rate savings, even though that goes a little more towards the general public uh, in the rural and you know the, uh, the post poster and other forms of savings which come in. Uh, uh, so, so that is one part. And then the second part, I think what you said is that uh, you are almost reaching the peak. Uh, the monetary policy has almost exhausting uh, the instruments now. So because the, the, the repo rates are maybe 25 basis point, uh, um, keeping uh, inflation, uh, though now is below the target, I think just below the target, uh, but still the RBI is cautious uh, and therefore might raise 25 basis point in the coming uh, the weak uh, uh, repo rate. Uh, but you said that uh, almost is near exhausted the instruments of monetary policy. I think they would now be more dovish uh, looking uh, towards more growth, right? Rather than inflation hawkish. Uh, no, I have, a, I have a small uh, disconnect there. So uh, what effectively is likely to happen is even as monetary policy uh, rate, the repo rate reaches uh, the terminal rate in this cycle, it's very unlikely that the RBI would be able to downshift or you know, provide a softish guidance. And the reason being very simple, core inflation has actually been fairly sticky, even though it's started to come off a little bit, but closer to six core inflation headline has actually been above the upper end of the policy band for a long period of time over the last 20, 24 months. It's just that it has started to get below the upper end. So the 
monetary policy target is four with plus minus two is a deviation that is allowed uh, on either side. So RBI of late has been very simply or I think uh, very clearly focused on getting inflation headline closer to the midpoint and more importantly, bringing core uh, uh, in a much more, you know, on a downward trajectory. So given that dynamic, uh, it's more likely to be a case where the RBI stays fairly cautious in its assessment, even as the monetary policy tightening uh, is, is done. So at some point down the line, as you go forward, the markets may actually start to uh, factor in the next, uh, or factor in a softish guidance. But I personally don't see the RBI relenting in its policy stance or guidance, at least for some more time, maybe a couple, few more months. It's probably second half of the year, as we start seeing headline closer to five and a bit of downshift in uh, the core. And more importantly, the Fed uh, should be done with tightening uh, by middle of the year. But again, there is a disconnect. I think uh, in one source of volatility for the markets, not necessarily the bond markets, is this shifting perceptions of global monetary policy uh, uh, cycle. So right now, the markets overseas have gone to the other extreme of expecting or pricing in rate cuts by the FOMC. Uh, in fact, they're pricing in three rate cuts uh, by the FOMC by the end of the year. I'm not really sure whether that is because uh, on Friday, there was a payroll number that came in substantially higher than market expectations. I think the payroll growth was almost 5 lakhs and market was expecting under 2 which is a huge and bond deal sold off uh, uh, significantly. But having said that, the market is still looking at at least two or three cuts by the FOMC in this calendar. And the FOMC so far has been very, very clearly focused on getting a headline to two and they have not given any guidance of a cut. So that disconnect as the market starts to reprice expectations in alignment with where the Fed is talking, that can bring in volatility as the year goes by for the broader market. Right, right. So I think so. I think you know the Rajiv is the um, chief investment officer of a largest mutual fund in India, SBI, and he also himself manages, uh, you know, like a professor of um, uh, medicine who himself also does surgery. Uh, so uh, he. So what do you think of uh, the debt segment now? Is there would there be a more inflows to uh, debt market because when the interest rate turns, uh, you, you know, down? Uh, you expect the people coming in there, and what about F, uh, FPIs? They they left that segment quite significantly. Yeah. So a uh, couple of things. So uh, I'll just uh, uh, go back to uh, 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 one of the remarks uh, Dr. Shukla also made with respect to government bringing down the uh, the, the surcharge uh, at the higher end of the tax slab. But at the same time, they have taken away a few things. So what they have done is, even though they have reduced the surcharge on higher income earners they have started taxing their investments. So there were a few avenues which uh, the SNIs used to invest in to avoid, I would not say avoid, bring down the tax. One was market-linked debentures, which used to attract uh, very favorable capital gains at 10%. That has now been taxed at the marginal rate, irrespective of the maturity. Then there were these uh, non-par uh, premium, uh, non-par uh, annuity-based products of insurance companies where uh, SNIs used to put so large premium products, which used to give you a guaranteed annuity, and those were tax-free. Today, they have said that if the premium on the uh, insurance product is exceeding 5 lakh, the income that you get as annuity will be taxed. So that takes away a large amount of uh, tax uh, uh, benefit that SNIs were gaining. And even on uh, the reinvestment of uh, a sale of a home profit uh, of a residential unit exceeding uh, 10 crore, I think now will get taxed. And one more thing they have done is they have started uh, deducting TCS on remittances. Even the LRS, which allows you to take money outside for investment purposes, they have brought in a 20% TCS uh, uh, tax collection as well. So overall, even though they have given relief on the income side, they have taxed investment. So, so some of these uh, measures, uh, what it could, like, could potentially do is lead to more flows into debt mutual funds. Because what had been happening over the last few years is market link debentures, the annuity tax-free products had effectively taken a lot of money out from debt mutual funds into uh, 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 some of these products. And sorry, one more, I mean, I think they were like, quote, one more measure that they announced is to put a withholding tax on bond payment, on, on coupons from bonds. So now if you buy a bond directly, the government will start putting, I think it is a 10% withholding tax that uh, they have announced. So quite a lot of these measures 
will should at least theoretically enable the debt mutual fund to be the first preferred choice for any investor to access the debt capital market so i personally think that should be a big boost for uh, flows into debt mutual funds aside the fact that monetary policy tightening is largely done and people can at some point so today the carry is good maybe as we go down down the line maybe a few months down the line there could be potential for backdated capital gains because if interest rates go down you get a benefit in terms of price appreciation so these could potentially get flows back into debt funds fpi sir you did mention about uh, them deserting indian bond markets and that's the story that has continued today the outstanding is less than 1 and 1/2% investment in sovereign bonds we have actually completely substantially opened up the uh, market but flows are not coming uh, there was a lot of uh, hope that index inclusion could be incentivized so last year the markets were hoping that uh, government would take away taxes they have not done this year in fact this year they have reinstated the withholding tax so what used to happen is the withholding tax as per statute uh, uh, for the fpi on their income from bonds used to be 20% but every year they used to provide a concessional 5% so every year the government used to renew that 5% rate this time they have said that the concessional rate will get over by june end and then you go back to 20 or if you have a tax treaty uh, double tax avoidance whatever is the treaty benefit that is what you will get so they have completely shut the door in terms of providing any incentive uh, to uh, get included in index to the taxation route but what we can uh, it can happen again uh, based on our own experience when we deal with uh, offshore investor because we co-manage a fund uh, with our uh, jv partner there is a lot of uh, compliance uh, i think dr shukla did mention about the extent of compliance requirement if you are setting up a plan or a unit it's similar in even for a simple investment in debt for example uh, when an offshore investor in indian debt has to actually a uh, churn is portfolio that is you want to sell something and then buy or maybe sell and remit the money back there is some requirement to get a tax certificate and that tax certificate is at every transaction level so someone who would want to say sell the 5 year gsa and you want to buy the 30 year with this proceeds you have to actually sell it go and get a tax uh, uh, certificate from your tax consultant which might take 2 to 3 days and some day sometime it may take even a week and then go and deploy so some of these ridiculous compliance procedures are there which can potentially be done away with uh, and even if you retain the capital gains as it is but if you make the the process of investing process of remitting money easier uh, and again the process of getting a registration easier which i think sebi has done is a lot that can actually incentivize the uh, uh, fpis to come and eventually once the interest rates globally uh, start to uh, settle down the people will look at emerging markets and that could be an opportunity as we go forward thank you very much so the summit all i think the bond index inclusion gets a little more delayed right yeah. and uh, so but you know given the time is is very short and i can see a lot of students uh, are interested to ask you questions so rather than we talking i think let me open up to the students with their questions uh, yes uh, could you uh, uh, moderate that uh, dibangsu Yes, sir. Uh, so I uh, hope uh, I'm audible to everybody. Yes. Yeah. So a lot of questions are coming in, sir. And uh, thanks for say, sharing your perspective. And uh, especially when you said that the idea of restructuring the revenue expenditure, especially the subsidies, and that too in a electoral, uh, you know, sensitive year, and putting in back back in capex. That's a very bold decision from government side. and just to make life simpler for my friends uh, and my batchmates so uh, what dr bhanumurthy was saying that that multiplier of 2.4 times it just means that 1 rupee putting in investment would yield to uh, 2.4 times the aggregate output so that's a very good thing uh, so the first question sir uh, which i want to ask is uh, regarding the old tax regime versus new tax regime so uh, there is a natural push from the government to uh, you know shift people towards the new tax regime so how do you see the impact of sh- that shift in the you know near, medium to long term uh, because a lot of people put money uh, they were following the old tax regime just to uh, you know uh, save their taxes uh, putting money in uh, you know atc products and things like that so so there will be some impact which will shift from investment 
to disposable income so how do you uh, see that so just if you can share your perspective on that this is for whom uh, sir any one of you can tackle this yeah, i never understood the tax system so maybe somebody else can yeah. okay so i think shukla can do that yeah. um so maybe uh, rajiv can uh, speak a bit more but for me i i think the big takeaway is uh, in in terms of the real impact right the government says that it's going to be losing about 35000 crore on account of this um net net i i don't think that this is really likely to pay dividends in in a year or or say 12 18 month period for me the biggest uh, takeaway for uh, from this is that this is a big behavioral shift that the budget is is really inducing what i mean by this is a, a lot of students might not know but come january february and a lot of farziwada started to happen uh, people <laughs> scampering all all these employees running around to get fake medical bill fake uh, ltc this that you know the whole office um in in any sort of uh, entity you spend these two months trying to get your house rent or whatever bill right petrol medical this and that bill i think this new generation i mean once people shift uh, it it has to be a substantial shift the fm and the finance ministry are hoping that at least 50 55% people are going to be shifting from the old to new so please remember this is not something that's been introduced only in this budget it's it's already been there but people because they've been holding on or wanting to use the existing benefits under the uh, old scheme uh, they tended to benefit more but now i think it's become a opt in or a opt out again a behavioral economics thing right if you want uh, you will have to opt out of the scheme otherwise you'll be permanently migrated into the new scheme right so i i think that's one very important thing people have to be very cautious uh and they have to do their math and there are multiple things that are out there that if you earn up to 15 lakh uh, you might get say 30 40 50000 or whatever depending on the uh, the income uh, or the slab but i i think for me the biggest change is simply this people will migrate now to a completely clean environment where you don't have to resort to these fictitious bills and every this is an open secret everybody who's worked knows Uh, how people resorted to, to all of this and and even the income tax authorities i mean right from top to bottom everybody knew this but it's been existing and i think to me the behavioral shift is much bigger than the fiscal implications of 30000 crore or or real benefit so i don't really see frankly this benefiting the consumption cycle also too much right because this depends on whether you opt in or opt out and depends on on each individual so i think there are too many ifs and buts so it may not really give you any big fiscal impact nor does it have a great consumption impact but i think over a period of time this is a big big behavioral change i i i did not think that i will see this in my working life uh, but here it is uh, we'll have a very clean system no hanky panky just pay your taxes and and be done with i i think this is the biggest take away for, for me uh, maybe rajiv can can add if he wants to yeah i agree it it's largely going to be how it's a behavioral uh, shift that they want to uh, engineer fiscally uh, this year uh, they have mentioned 35000 but again lots of it's then but but my uh, my hope rather would be that this is the first step to sort of simplify and widen the direct tax uh, base uh, because when we look at the numbers 6% of gdp or probably less than that is a direct tax to gdp ratio even today the gtr to gdp is just about 11 11 1/2 one of the lowest probably in the world so there is a lot that the government hopefully will do over the next few years to bring up or improve tax compliance on the direct tax side uh, so beyond that on immediate impact on consumption i'm not really sure i think it takes a while for people to sort of i think individually everyone needs to see what is better but i think uh, my uh, simple take on what the government has i mean at least my reading is uh, they have given something but they have taken away something else so the sni thing is a classic case where you've taken away or rather given something optically but taken away a lot so on a net net basis there may not be much difference 
got it sir so it's more on the behavioral uh, impact which is uh, significant yeah. rather than the uh, physical impact can i can i just uh, add one line i th i think we sir. need to look at from the uh, overall perspective of uh, the government the, you know the new wage code which uh, is coming the salary code where you would have to have these elements of allowances to be merged uh, brought into some cap in the salary and then uh, at the lower end, the government tries to increase the slab, you know, so therefore that there is an exemption and uh, standardize the large portion of the taxpayers, which is there, they would come to the wage code. So I think, I think there is a trend and Rajiv rightly pointed out, uh, Dr. Shukla as well. So I think there is a trend to eliminate and, you know, standardize and take out all of this, not just direct, even in indirect, everywhere. Uh, so that's the, the huge exemptions and all of this. We are moving towards a more standardized, transparent, and manageable uh, structure. Uh, yes. Thank you, sir. Uh, sir, uh, my next question is for Rajiv, sir. That is more towards the corporate bond market. So we haven't seen uh, the corporate bond market taking off in India, especially. And uh, there is also, you know, so last year, I think Rizal put out a report saying that, you know, the, the corporate bond market is at an inflection point and uh, outstanding stock is somewhere around 40 trillion rupees and it can go to, uh, you know, 60, 70 uh, trillion rupees by next, uh, in the next two, three years. And also government has introduced, introduced several schemes like national infrastructure pipeline and huge CAPEX plans. Uh, you know, in back in 2019-20, that requires a lot of borrowing, and uh, that should not uh, come from only banks, and uh, you know, because that that is also a systemic risk. So, how do you see that uh, you know co corporate bond market panning out in near term? And because uh, in retail also there is a lot of uh, you know uh, interest and appetite in investing in corporate bonds. So recently, something like NHI Invit uh, was uh, you know uh, went for IPO, and it was subscribed like seven times. Similarly, many of these uh, bonds were oversubscribed by, you know, in uh, significant uh, times. So how do you see that uh, corporate bond market finding out? Uh, so uh, so this, is a, this is a very uh, favorite topic of mine, or rather something that ever since I entered the market, I've been here. There have been so many committees that have been set up to develop the bond market. A lot of suggestions come in. And to give them credit, a lot, of, lot has been done. Uh, and, uh, the, and most of the measures, which... Uh, the regulators, government, RBI, all of them, and SEBI, of course. Uh, what they have done is uh, largely on the supply side, you know, in the sense that they have done a lot to uh, streamline the issuances of corporate bonds, to incentivize uh, uh, large corporates to mandatorily uh, borrow a certain percentage of the incremental borrowing from bond market, introduce, uh, you know, online platforms and all that. But... Very little has been done to incentivize the demand side. And uh, I mean, I, I would say uh, the retail investor demand or maybe the demand from offshore. So the whole focus, rightly so, I mean, I'm not quarreling, the whole focus on the regulatory side to develop the bond market has been on the supply side to encourage the issuance of bond, to streamline the process, make it uh, platform driven, bidding uh, similar to the government securities in some respects. So, they have done a lot on that side, but very little has been done to incentivize demand. Now, a simple uh, a reference that I can give you. you know, we've again had so many committees sitting and debating how municipal bond issuances can pick up. And, and, and uh, 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 invariably, it comes to a comparison of US market, the municipal bond market. The simple thing is the market there developed on the basis of tax incentives. I mean, there is a tax-free status that has been given. We, we're not willing to give any of those. And we sort of try and compare uh, 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 compare why our municipal bond market is not evolving. Uh, similarly, on the, the, uh, the taxation side on debt, now we have a template that we've already done in equity. For a long period of time, uh, uh, we didn't have capital gains. It got introduced recently, but again, uh, there's a one-year uh, holding period. But what have we done on the fixed income side? We've actually, if you invest in a debt mutual fund, you need to wait for three years. Uh, of course, you get the indexation benefit, benefit but capital gain is three years. Uh, in this budget, again, you put uh, uh, withholding tax on coupons, so that in a way will disincentivize direct investment. So I think the, the way to do it is now to incentivize demand. If it is through tax break, so be it, but maybe do it through a, you know, give a few years uh, uh, and then take it away so that the market develops. So I think there is some 
very clearly a requirement to incentivize demand, which so far has not really been done. Hopefully, some of these measures that the government announced to reduce the tax arbitrage or tax avoidance by large SNIs could potentially lead to some flows coming back into debt mutual funds, which can again uh, be a source of uh, demand incentivization. But I think there is a requirement to at least have a, probably a favorable taxation regime, at least for some time, so that people are incentivized to put money in uh, debt or directly or maybe through debt funds. That, that so basically parity in capital gains tax and some parity, tax or maybe some uh, favorable treatment and maybe sorry the other part is again on the institutional side for example the longest uh, uh, or the largest players on the debt side uh, uh, are the uh, uh, the pf insurance companies they don't really trade in secondary market their investment pattern is purely buy and hold I think the regulatory relaxation or incentivization should be. So mutual funds are the largest segment in terms of daily secondary liquidity in bonds because we have uh, daily NAV, daily redemption inflow. So we generate a lot of secondary market liquidity. But the largest investors who have the risk capital, who have the holding period from liquidity angle, they don't trade. They just buy the primary and then goes into their HDM book. So insurance, pension funds, provident funds, their bond allocation or their bond investment framework needs to be a little bit more flexible, which wow. will allow them to be actively participating and trading in secondary. So that's an enabler required for developing secondary market, which again is a regulatory side intervention that they have. Got it, sir. Uh, so I think, sir, we have a lot of questions, but we don't have time. So we have already exceeded by uh, 10 minutes. I think we have a second panel discussion. Can I, can I just ask a quick questions to all the three panelists? You see, yes, sir. We have been dreaming of this fi uh, sooner 5 trillion, and then now we are talking of 7 trillion economy. Professor Banamurthy, could you just say one liner when? No, no. I, I think it's, I mean, I, I mean, I... I have done a study on this. I mean, it was the submitted yeah. to the 15th Finance Commission. One easy way to get into 5 trillion economy in five years is to revert back to the original FRB Act of 2003. I think that's the only. So, so that brings, uh, I mean, more more fiscal uh, restraint. Is that what we are talking? Not necessarily fiscal restraint. I mean, it all linked. You see, fiscal and monetary are not two separate entities. Right. Um, you know, when you are reducing uh, the fiscal component, I'm sure it will give more cushion to the monetary and also to the financial markets, right? So, in fact, the whole uh, in this whole drama between monetary and fiscal, it is the domestic saving that plays a major role. I think we need to provide more resources to the private sector. At the same time, you know, uh, you have a fiscally prudent policies. Then only you will be able to achieve this five trillion economy. Dr. Shukla. That's a different topic. I'll maybe later we can. No, sure, sure. But yes, Dr. Shukla, any? So I think uh, this whole fascination about 5 trillion is misplaced, I would say. Uh, why just stop at 5 trillion? I mean, there is a simple rule of 72 uh, that we all know in, in finance, we have taught that, right? If the nominal GDP is going to be growing at, say, 11, 12%, this is an economy that's going to double in size every six years. So why just keep talking about 5 trillion? This is going to be 10, 15 trillion in, in, in some time, right? I, I think let uh, mathematics work. Let uh, some of these reforms really work. Let's be focused on really trying to improve the quality of life. So ease of living, ease of doing business, uh, enhancing competitiveness. I, I think that is something that we need to look for. Uh, let's not get carried away or, or let's not try to become too uh, narrowly focused on these numbers. Uh, let me tell all of these students here, this economy will double every six to seven years. And, and no country in the world right now, uh, US, UK, Europe, Japan, none of these developed economies can even hope to double in even 20, 25 years. So if you're a parent to a child, in these countries, you will not see doubling of incomes and standard of living in your lifetime, right? So here is an economy where incomes will grow. We need to see how it is getting distributed, percolates down, etc. So therefore, I'm saying let's focus on ease of doing business, cost of doing business, reforms, and ease of living. I, I think rest will, will just happen. So it's sheer uh, mathematics and, and magic of compounding. So let's not get uh, fascinated or carried 
away by just this one small number. Right? But, the but, economy but is going give, to wonders over time. But you gave a very nice uh, anecdote to our next session, the multi-year bull run that we are going to discuss now. Thank you. Dog, uh, Rajiv ji, would you like to make a last one line? Yeah, yeah I, I'll go with uh, what uh, Professor Panamurthy also said. Uh, for me, I think this 5 trillion, honestly, I and mean, that's a political statement, but uh, or the political target. But what we need to see or what we as well, or me as a market analyst uh, or a student of economics would want to see in the next five years is one, a clear glide path on fiscal consolidation, get it close to three, re eliminate revenue deficit, bring down public debt to GDP from where we are, from 85 to maybe a direction towards 60, 65, which they have committed to. And finally, more importantly, I think what will enable both of this is increasing direct tax to GDP. It cannot remain at six, which is very low from even peer group nation comparison perspective. So increase it. And I think then the whole uh, uh, framework will be set in place for maybe five, 10, or maybe even 15 trillion. GDP. <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to get off a minute. No, I started by saying that, you know, uh, in the absence of planning commission, in the absence of the fiscal council, we don't have any medium term institutions really to focus on the medium term growth. I mean, I'm sure uh, Dr. Shukla and others will agree the way private companies have a bottom line. I think for macro economy also, 5 trillion may be a broader bottom line. We, we are an aspirational economy. I think, um, you know, we, we need to compare with many countries where we have a very long gap in terms of growth and development. I think the 5 trillion may be a bottom line for a macro economy. Thank you. Thank you very much from my side, uh, uh, Dr. Shukla, doc, Dr. Banamurthy and uh, Rajiv ji. All of you have been so kind and friends for long and we, we definitely look forward to it. Over to you, Avit. Yeah. Uh, so now with this, we bring the first session for, for the first panel for the day to a closure. And the, the panel primarily discussed about all the insights and the key takeaways from the recently released union budget. Uh, the topics discussed were relating to the fiscal math as highlighted by the points mentioned by uh, Dr. Banamurthy in the beginning regarding need for a better fiscal consolidation and a better roadmap for a country in the future regarding the same. Then we had a discussion regarding the CapEx where Dr. Shashidanan had made important observations about the pros and cons of the same, like wherein obviously higher capex would have ha, would help our country for a better fiscal multiplier effect and would he help us in growing economy at an even faster rate. But at the same time, we would be having relatively lesser flexibility to uh, reorient in case of in 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 case of any unforeseen exigencies, uh, like he had mentioned about the Ukraine crisis and so forth. And finally, we had uh, Mr. Rajiv who pointed out the implications of changes and in the government schemes, for instance, uh, there were uh, changes in the senior citizen saving scheme wherein the amount has been doubled and the returns on it is approximately 8%. Then you also brought out points regarding the upcoming monetary policy committee meeting, which is going to be scheduled and also the implications that it will have with respect to the budget that we recently had. So now finally, I, on the behalf of my all the colleagues who are present here, who helped us in organizing the event and the entire XLRA community as a whole, would uh, really like to offer my thanks and gratitude to all the speakers who were present for the today's session, like Dr. N. R. Ba uh, Dr. N. R. Bhanumurthy, Dr. Sachitanan, and Mr. Rajiv uh, Radhakrishnan for taking out time out of their really busy schedules and discussing their views and opinions about the budget, uh, which have been forced out of so many years of experience and working over their craft. So we're really thankful and grateful for, for her presence, sir. And I would also at the same time like to thank our uh, revered finance faculty here, Dr. H.K. Pradhan, for moderating the session for the benefit of all the uh, attendees in the meeting. Uh, so you. now we would be uh, uh, proceeding and moving on to starting off with the second panel for the day. And we have Prithvi for introducing the panelists. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Professor Banamurthy. Thank you. So thank you, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so we have four esteemed panelists here with us for the discussion of the budget along the lines of the capital markets. And Professor H.K. Pradhan would be a moderator for this session as well. So first we have uh, Ms. Rajani Sinha. She's the chief economist at the Carriage Group. And she's an expert on the macro and micro domains rela related to the real estate sector. Also, she has worked as an economist at various prestigious banks in the past. Thank you for being here, ma'am. Next, we have Mr. Debopam Chaudhary, who is the chief economist at Piramal Enterprises. He's a macro strategist and economist and has over 16 years of industry experience. He has also worked on several RBI panels and he is also actively involved in the Indian start startup ecosystem, especially fintech, 
the startup that he incubated was Zyphin. Thank you, sir, for being here. Uh, further, we have Sabal Ghosh with us, Mr. Sabal Ghosh. He's the chief investment officer at Aegon Life. He has over 22 years of experience in asset management uh, in the equity and fixed income domain. He has a deep knowledge of the dynamics of the industry, especially the AMCs, insurance companies, banks, etc. Thank you, sir, for being here. Uh, and last but not the least, we have uh, Mr. Labanya Prakash Jaina, who's the regional climate finance advisor uh, at the Commonwealth. He has worked with the CPI, which is the climate policy initiative prior to this. Also, he has been part of making the uh, finance roadmap for India, the sustainable finance roadmap for India as a consultant at UNDP. Uh, we are happy to have you here with us, sir. Over to you, Pradhan, sir, for the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh... All Thank the you, panelists and uh, the Madam Ranjani ji, uh, Devapom ji, the, the Saibal ji and Lavanya ji. I think Saibal and Lavanya would be laughing when I say ji. <laughs> and we, has, we have been friends and so so. Thank you so much for being here. This uh, We have a little, but I think they open-ended. We can still go 10 minutes later, uh, post one o'clock if, if we have time. So we had a fantastic uh, discussion in the first one, the panel one, which was basically uh, on the macro drivers of this budget. And I think everyone was gung-ho in many ways, uh, uh, though there are, there are concerns and issues about the long term and the sifting composition of India's, uh, you know, the expenditure pattern, the capex versus revenue, et cetera. Uh, so, so now I think we are we are more talking about the, the. I think the students have given us the title, setting the stage for a multi-year bull run, and I think uh, that's that's possibly the India story, which is uh, uh, you know reverberating everywhere else. Uh, so I think uh, given this macro backdrop supporting this kind of. Uh, a rising star, India as a rising star in the global capital market is something I think we could uh, come in. And the budget which provides the early pointers or the continued uh, focus which has been there of the government. And uh, I think to be very brief, the India is emerging as one of the fastest growing economy in the world, 7% growth rate. I think they're coming back from the contraction of 7.3% in 2021. So I think we have done uh, very quickly, we have recovered in over a three year period with a positive growth rate now uh, and uh, reaching around $3 trillion now, uh, FY23. And uh, in the last session, there were quite uh, exuberance about if we grow uh, 10 to 11% in every five, six years, we might even double. Uh, so, so that that was a very good uh, pointer, and there is there is visible trend in the economy, modernization of infrastructure. There are many segments of the economy growing faster. There is digital push. The growth momentum has taken place in the IT, automobiles, pharmaceutical, select electronics, including even the mobile phones. And uh, everyone uh, talks about the India's demographic dividends which is expected to play out in future in the young population. India provides an increasingly large pool of global uh, skilled manpower. Uh, so sum it all, I think the Indian story remains very strong, but at the same time, there are, there are issues, concerns about the global economic prospects, the global worries, the yield curve in the US, uh, which is getting inverted. So signaling the recession, the geopolitical risk, the post-war, the energy prices continue to be extremely volatile. So all of these are now the global situations possibly turn out to be difficult. Uh, given that uh, the post budget immediately, I thought the market cheered up except the Hindenburg research reports, which turned around this, uh, the, the pessimism in the market. Uh, but uh, I, I'm sure that this, uh, the, this would come up, uh, cover up in, in the near term and uh, the, the market would uh, try to uh, uh, develop resilience to the, the, the And if, if you look at the financial sector, I think there is a fair degree of stability in the Indian financial sector. During the COVID, inflation is well under the RBI target now, closer, but hopefully uh, would be maintained. The NPAs of the banking systems have improved significantly thanks to the government restructuring mechanism in the place. And there is a huge digitalization adding on to the value across all sectors uh, of the economy. 
so there are many positive vibes uh, in the economy and also in the budget. And I'm sure the, these positivity would reflect going forward in the Indian uh, uh, you know, equity market or financial market. So gentlemen and madam, I think I welcome you to this uh, uh, very interesting part of the story uh, that we are going to discuss. Our students are keen and uh, uh, to know uh, the, the trends that are going to be highlighted uh, in, in, in the financial market, the macro behind this. So can I, uh, can I start with uh, Ms. Ranjani Sinha? Uh, Madam, uh, uh, apart from the fact that you come from a rating agencies, you might try to give a rating to this budget, but the general macroeconomic impact of the budget that have an influence on the financial sector. Over to you, Madam. Uh, firstly, uh, good afternoon and thank you very much for this giving me this opportunity. I must say that I am from Jamshedpur, so XLRI has a special place for me. Um, now, coming to your question, Mr. Pradhan, I think, you know, uh, if you ask me to rate the budget, I would give it a very high rating, probably 10 upon 10 or maybe 9 upon 10. Because we have to understand in the given circumstances what the budget has done. Um, if I look at it in terms of, uh, to begin with, the consumption, though there has not been a very direct, strong boost to consumption, there have been some measures announced in terms of income tax changes, which you would have discussed in the previous panel. Uh, but the indication is that government has taken care of this segment in some ways. And in fact, consumption, we wouldn't have want the government to go out of the way and give a lot on that front because that would have been inflation. And we have to appreciate that we are going through a phase where while inflation has gone under RBI's upper band, but still core inflation is high and there are concerns around inflation, more so with all the global uncertainties around us. And in such a situation, there has uh, the budget has continued to focus on CAPEX which is a strong positive, which will be taken positively by the financial markets, and at the same time, continued with fiscal consolidation. So uh, that's, again, another thing which market is looking at very closely. If the market, ha if the budget had faltered on this front, it would have been taken negatively by the market. So it's a good aspect that even while focusing on CAPEX, the fiscal consolidation path has continued. And See, this was, you know, there was a lot of expectation on what is going to happen to the budget in terms of populist measures. Will there be freebies given that this is the last full budget before the elections? And it was good to see that the government has refrained from that. So I think, you know, all these aspects would be looked at positively by the financial markets. Again, to highlight one more aspect before I talk specifically on the impact on markets. Uh, the quality of expenditure, uh, if I look at revenue expenditure, it has grown by only some 1.5% or so, whereas capital expenditure has grown by a good more than 30%. So now the outcome is that revenue to capital expenditure, the ratio that we look at to see what is happening to the quality of expenditure, that has improved from around 6 to 7 that we used to have pre-pandemic years. It went down to around 4.5 last year and more so to 3.5% or so this year. So the improvement in quality of expenditure is something which is being looked at very positively by the market. So I think in the given situation and also the, uh, the uh, budget did not announce anything to destabilize the market. In terms of there were some concerns about capital gains tax and the, the budget just refrained from touching that aspect broadly. So again, that is a positive for the market. And in a situation like this, where you know the global economy is going through a slowdown, and for India, we are still, still talking about around 6% of, of growth, uh, it would be looked at positively by the FPIs also. So I think for equity market, there were a lot of positives to pick out from. But like you said, there are other reasons why the market uh, uh, you know, reacted in the last post the budget. So otherwise, if we leave that aside from the budget, there were positives to be taken by the equity market. If I look at the debt market, again, um, like I mentioned, the budget is not going to be inflationary, which is a plus. And in a situation where we are expecting overall inflation to moderate further, 
you know, with all the rate hikes that, that has happened so far with the commodity prices, global commodity prices moderating. On the inflation scenario also, we are expecting further moderation in the coming year. So that's a positive for the debt market. The gross government borrowing at 15.4 uh, lakh crore that was higher than uh, last year, but it was broadly on market expectations. So that's something, again, which will not be taken adversely by the market. So I think for the debt market, uh, again, uh, I would say a positive impact of the budget. Now, uh, if I look at the forex market, uh, forex market, I think going forward, like I mentioned before, we can expect improvement in SPI flows happening. Uh, because we are talking about a situation where globally growth is slowing down and India is going to look like a, India is already looking like a, you know, right spot in midst of all this uncertainty. So with expectation of US Fed probably stopping by the middle of uh, this year and even cutting by the end of the year, I think we can see improvement in FBI flows happening. So that's one aspect. The other aspect is that, you know, for our currency market, we have been concerned about widening of our current account deficit. So current account deficit in FY23 is budgeted to, estimated to widen around 3.5% uh, or so. But, you know, while we are expecting exports growth to slow down in FY24, imports growth is also going to slow down. So net-net, we are expecting that CAD is going to moderate from there to around FI24 around 2.2 to 2.5% or so. So I think these two factors would provide comfort to the currency market too forward. Oh, thank you. I think you were even more positive than, than the media that I could see. So it seems everything is going well. And, no, uh, there are concerns which we will eventually uh, talk about. But I, I think, I think you see, I think the one important thing if you agree that this finance minister and the government, as far as the budget is concerned, I think they have been on track and the track record has not been so much, uh, so much pessimistic, uh, you know, the outcome is, is, has not been there. I think even and specifically during, during the COVID, uh, I think the way the fiscal situations have been managed. And I, I, I think I appreciate that point that possibly 20, FY24, there would be large inflows of foreign investment, FDI, due to global uh, issues maybe, and uh, then FPI. I think there was large withdrawals which had happened in equity as well as bonds substantially. I think there would be reverse uh, in that. And remittances are already on. I think there's a huge remittances that has already come into India, given our interest rates. Uh, so I, I think there would be large capital inflows. Reserve buildup will, will be there. Possibly currency market. I think you rightly said that the exports might come down, so also imports. So current account deficits might be uh, with capital, uh, good capital inflows, reserve buildup. I think currency market will be st more stable uh, going forward. Thank you. Thank you for this point. I think let me now turn to uh, Debo Pomji. Uh, corporate India, almost everyone has, I haven't heard anybody complaining anything. They held this budget. And now, uh, so everything on track for the companies, quarterly results we have just seen and uh, uh, for going forward, all well, that supports the equity market. Let's leave aside a little bit the governance issues which has cropped up, but otherwise uh, uh, all well. Yeah, so you're asking me all well or you're telling all well? No, I, I'm asking your comment from the budget, <laughs> yes. Absolutely. No, no, I think things are going well as of now, and the budget has given a good leg up to, so to ensure that the rest of the year, no major hiccups as far as, you know, the government's outlook is concerned comes up for the corporates. So, you know, first of all, good afternoon, and thank you for ha having me here. And I understand the majority of the audience today are management students. So, you know, it makes more sense to keep the discussion as simple and storytelling like uh, than, you know, getting into a lot of numbers and technicalities of the budget. So I'll just do just that. And since any which way this is the second session, I'm sure a lot of the students would be a kind of, you know, we all understand that. We've been through that. Uh, on a philosophical level, you know, sir, what, what are budgets at the end of the day? They're just annual events with a very short-term myopic view about the next 12 months. And 12 months is nothing from the context of an economy like that of India. 
so we are talking about a 10 trillion economy we are talking about an economy which will emerge out of being an emerging economy to a developed country like the us or uk and all of this that is the migration to developed ma market is going to happen over the next 20 25 years so in this entire scheme of event one annual budget i think there is a overdue you know analysis done on if, and this is done every year since budgets were introduced but over weightages are placed on this because what is more important is what is the government's long term plan in achieving the various long term tar targets for a developing country like india is so getting that of the way you know i think the impact of annual budget is just limited to conveying the thought process of the present government and that can very well change also when once a new government comes due to elections political issues and so on and so forth but at least at the beginning of april every year it conveys a message that okay we are in sync with what corporate india expects or we are not in sync with what corporate india expects and this is exactly what happened this time the government conveyed the message marvelously to corporate india that they are in sync with whatever needs to be done in order to take the economy to a 10 trillion economy as uh, uh, you know you guys were talking in the previous panel or even more in making india a developed country with adequate per capita income which is in line with what world bank would accept to qualify india as a developed country but over a 2025 year and this budget as i said did, did the job uh, marvelously so now coming to some specifics you know uh, you know against a 10% rise in the expected revenue so if you add up all the revenue expenditures which were planned there has been on uh, basically a 10% rise in expected re re revenue right uh, sorry sorry the revenue earned and against that the expenditures that the government is planning is just 8% so this mismatch wherein earnings are more in percentage terms versus expenditure that itself has given a lot of support to not just the equity markets but the debt markets because this underlies the fiscal prudence that this government has in an effort to you know make india fiscally responsible and fiscally sustainable going forward and in the second part of my discussion i will touch upon the various problems in india regarding capital and this particular element would go a long way in addressing these problems and and this also has reverberated really well amongst corporate india that okay this government is really serious about meeting the fiscal deficit target of uh, what i think 4.5% by fy fy26 without in fact you know as rajni was also saying without in fact sacrificing on any of the long term goals how is the plan going to work out say for example 10% rise in income versus 8% rise in expenditure which was this budget essentially about you know there's this book which was published by mr vijay kelkar and ajay shah some years back called uh, in the service of nations and there they had estimated that for every 1 rupee that the central bank spends as much as 75 paisa is wasted more in some schemes less in others but on an average about 75 paisa is the leakage on every 1 rupee spent this budget and maybe a couple of previous budgets have been trying to plug this hole in, in my opinion and and this is what is generating a lot of confidence in the private sector and and you know the government is working towards what they call in the us as or or in the, in, in english language as you know maximum bang for the buck so every 1 rupee spent should have minimum leakages some amount of leakages is you know you cannot avoid it but it cannot be as high as 75 paisa and this is this budget is in sync with that and you know many of you are taking economics uh, classes pradhan sir is there i'm guess i think santanu sir is also there he used to be my professor at gokule and and i'm sure you you guys understand that what is economics but for maximizing utility for the same amount spent right and that's exactly what is happening right now and and this is a very welcome change the focus is in the right direction uh, again coming to some specific announcements which has got the corporate sector really excited is the significant rise in the awas yojana right now the awas yojana is directly connected to indians india's real estate ecosystem and the real estate real estate ecosystem is huge it has buyers it has developers it has sellers it has lenders right and the multiplier effect of such measures can be very very high so in fact real estate if you do a little math you realize back of the envelope calculation suggests that real estate accounts for about 10% of the gdp and that is directly indirectly it supports about 200 to 300 industries so if there is even a minor focus or increase in outlay in some basic area of real estate the multiplier effect from that to about 200 300 industries in the country 
can be massive and that's what is expected to be and in fact i was there in a discussion with the fm uh, uh, in, she came down to mumbai with, to meet the you know the stakeholders from industry and this was the same point she was making so so the multiplier effect is what the government is trying to play around and and they, they are impacting industries which has some of the highest interactions or interactivities with other industries and real estate being a great example for that uh, also in the case of employment so real estate is one of the largest employment generators in the country and all of this obviously will boil down to consumption and we all know 56 percent to 60 percent of our country is consumption and hence at the end of the day consumption is going, going to get a uh, massive fillip uh, focus on pharma again something very interesting pharma has proved itself to be a very potent player especially after the covid uh, 19 episode the our, our ability to uh, you know research and development and come out and roll out with their vaccines has been an eye opener for the rest of the world we have been doing great work with generics we have been large, one of the largest exporters of generic medicines which which is giving medicines at a very affordable cost to the rest of the world and this government has given its due recognition to this sector there has been a lot of uh, changes which has been in uh, on the way, but obviously this budget acknowledging it, it as well as the economic survey, you know, dedicated dedicating quite a few of, uh, pages to the pharma sector was also very appealing for the pharma folks out there. So obviously the end goal where the government wants India's pharma sector to be, or even what the pharma sector itself wants to be in, in the global context with the China plus one model kicking in is still, you know, uh, five to six years away, I would say. But then the, the focus for the next 12 months is definitely going to give a good, solid, clean runway to take off at least. So that's what, you know, incremental budgets are for. And finally, I would like to touch upon the MSMEs. You know, MSMEs are the heartthrob of the country. MSMEs are generating 30% of GDP, it's generating 50% of our exports. It's, it's hiring 100 million people, majority in the blue collar space. So it's, it's a massive beast altogether. Unfortunately, you know, the last couple of years because of COVID lockdowns and all MSMEs across the board have suffered a lot. But then the government has come up, it has always been supportive of the MSMEs, but then this budget also it continues with the, 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 the supportive environment they want to lend to MSMEs. So announcements like they are going to fund from the taxpayers money 95% of the forfeited deposits, you know, which MSMEs had to give because they could not meet contracts because they were stuck of the lockdowns. So government is going to pay for that. Then, you know, the, the extension in the credit guarantee scheme, that is something which is going to generate additional liquidity for a lot of these MSMEs. So these are very positive uh, me uh, measures. In fact, you know what, when, when these MSMEs are now going to banks to get more working capital, it is a norm with banks to just check the performance for the last two years. And it has been like this for some time, nothing uh, against the banks. But, you know, be because the last two years were bad, the underwriting capability of the bank is also getting restricted. So here the government is trying to make a dent by giving more and more credit guarantees so that, you know, the MSMEs can keep rolling, especially the, the micro units, if not the smaller uh, medium units in the definition, definition of uh, MSME. And obviously, we all know about the infra spending and the huge amount of uh, you know, uh, 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 trick, trickle down it'll have, etc. So that's that's something you know has been already discussed in the previous panel. I would presume. So so that this is this is where I would like to stop at, at this point and and underline that yes, it was a very positive from a directional point of view, if not from an actual spending perspective. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Devakumji. Thank you. I think uh, the. Uh, Excellent observations, and uh, I appreciate your point on MSMEs. The government continues to provide support to MSMEs, the, the extension of credit guarantee scheme and the emergency credit guarantee scheme, the reimbursement of that for fair deposits. And I think all of them are very positive measures, but nevertheless, the MSME is still reeling under this COVID type of crisis that occurred to their business. Uh, in fact, we just did a study recently, very recently on the MSMEs. Uh, but there are a lot of advents in terms of credit, the mudra loans, they all have geared up and the banks extended significant amount of credit under these guarantee schemes. Uh, that was one of the main drivers of bank credit of tech. So, so I think things have been going well. Uh, so, and you, I appreciate your second point that the CapEx would have a larger multiplier effect in the economy then the revenue side expenditure of the government because the capex would involve steel that would involve cement that would involve downstream industries and i think multiplier effect and less inflationary 
uh, and it would uh, boost uh, industry manufacturing, etc. I think that's a very valid point. But let me come back. You also highlighted this uh, case of India reaching uh, uh, 10 trillion economy. Uh, so if one thing this historically finance uh, the research has brought in, if you regress the growth with equity, I think there's always a linear relationship positive. So if the, there is a growth, the equity markets have given you returns. And now you translate into whether that leads to corporate earnings, that leads to many other ways, so which the equity drives. Uh, over to you, Saibal. So are we really preparing for a bull run or are there sectoral hitch or are there other uh, pessimism clouds on the sky? Uh, so, so I think everybody wants to know from you as to the long term, medium term scope uh, of equity market and bond market. I think fairly we have we're now getting. Into Hi. It seems to be going. Yeah, I'm also seeing it's echoing. I don't know why. Um, okay, I think Lavanya, you speak by the time. Let me come back and dialogue. Uh, sir, you are on mute. So, uh, so we will be back to Saibal. Uh, uh, sorry about that. So we are now back to Lavanya, a good friend. And uh, Lavanya works, uh, Lavanya, you are also on mute, uh, works on climate finance for the Commonwealth Secretariat. In fact, he is doing his PhD as well um, uh, here in XLRI on climate finance. He's an expert. Uh, other than the, anything that you would like to speak on the budget, we would like to hear about this green, the green initiatives, climate focus of India, and the budget and green bonds. Uh, thank you, sir. Thanks. Thanks for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here, particularly in a, in, a, in an institute where you are pursuing your doctoral degree. Still, I have not completed. Uh, okay, it's a couple of things before uh, uh, I'm giving, just to give a context, actually. So if, if I see in last two years, uh, India has, has announced several measures to transition economy, particularly if you see in Glasgow in 2021, India has increased its uh, international commitment to reduce carbon intensity. Uh, six, seven years back, we committed that we are going to reduce carbon intensity by 31 to 33%, and we increased it to 45%. So India is one of the few countries who have already committed uh, the carbon intensity target by 2020, but the target was for 2030. Uh, in addition to that, India has other commitments like uh, adding 500 gigawatt of renewable energy capacity by 2030. And recently also, you might, might be aware, not recently, one year back, India also announced uh, to achieve net zero by 2070 or so. Uh, then currently we have, India has taken over the presidency of G20. And if you see G20, number of times India is discussing about sustainability. And uh, last month, in the, in the month of January also, India issued its first sovereign green bonds. Uh, the total amount they have generated, I think, around 16,000 crores or so. Uh, although the kind of premium they were expecting, they didn't, they, they, they didn't get. Initially, six months back, the Ministry, Ministry of Finance they said that we'll get a premium of 30 to 40 basis points of sovereign green bonds, but uh, they didn't realize that. Actually, the premium is only five to seven basis points. Although it was not, uh, I mean, why they were expecting they would uh, generate a premium from green bonds, I, I'm not aware of that. because I don't know what, what's the reason, because the issuer is same, so there is no credit risk. There is no difference between a conventional sovereign bonds and sovereign green bonds. Uh, in addition to that, last year, last for last year, India also set up a sustainable uh, finance working group also. So that's the, that's the background of why this project is important from the green perspective. Uh, number one is that on the renewable energy sector, for example, uh, the government announced a number of things, particularly uh, setting up solar plants in Ladakh, but I think there is more for a geopolitical perspective. So they have announced to, to allocate around 10,000 Eight to nine thousands of dollars of capital, and nine thousand crores of capital in Ladakh uh, to set up uh, solar plants as well as evacuation and transmission. That's a that's a very very positive decision. Uh, secondly, uh, before the budget, uh, uh, India already announced uh, 
about allocating around 18,000 crores of capital for hydrogen sector. Hydrogen sector. Hydrogen is very, very critical for India. Number one is that uh, currently hydrogen is not commercially viable. And uh, in order to reduce carbon intensity, particularly in the hard to decarbonization industries like shipping, airlines, steel, iron, and cement, uh, hydrogen is very, very essential. Uh, since hydrogen is not commercially viable, the government has announced that, okay, uh, let's put, give some incentive to, manu- to the manufacturer of hydrogen so that it will be commercially viable. Currently, the, the cost of hydrogen is around 4 to $8, $8 per kg. So to reach a commercial viability of hydrogen across the sector, it should be $1 per kg. So that's the equation everybody thinks. It depends on the price of renewable energy. Since the price of renewable energy has crashed in last 10 years or so, so we are hoping that we will achieve uh, the, the cost parity in the case of hydrogen uh, by, by, by 2030 or so. That's an, another important area. Uh, then uh, there is a possibility that uh, a, a lot of amount of uh, that particular capital would be used in manufacturing electrolyzer. So the cost of electrolyzer is, is very, very expensive for the time being. Uh, once we achieve uh, the scale of economics in the case of electrolyzer, definitely we are going to reduce uh, the cost of hydrogen. Uh, besides that, there are some announcements, for example, in the case of electric vehicle. So as we know that uh, government is keeps on talking about uh, transitioning from combustion vehicles to electric vehicles, so that it will, it's not only going to reduce carbon intensity, uh, it is also going to uh, reduce the pollution level of particular in the cities where the pollution level is very, very high. Uh, but electricity, electric vehicle itself is not uh, carbon neutral unless uh, the source of energy is clean in nature. Currently, the source of electricity here in India is coal. Uh, 75% of electricity generation is coming from the coal sector, not from renewable energy. So we need to change that. Uh, but before that, we need to reach at a level where the co- cost of electric vehicle is also commercially viable, particularly if we see uh, in the case of three wheelers or two wheelers, even if cars also, there is commercial viability. Uh, but still, we have not uh, reached that level where there will be mass scale manufacturing and adoption of uh, electric vehicles. So that's the reason uh, government of India has announced actually doubled uh, the, the incentive, which, which, which the scheme name is same as so. So they doubled from around 2,800 crores to 5,700 crores, which is very, very positive signal for electric vehicles. Uh, then another program, they have shared that green credit program, but it's not clear actually. So how they are going to so, uh, support uh, the green sector. So there is a possibility that uh, they could provide subsidized capital to the green sector. Although, I mean, by definition, uh, there is no definition actually by government of India what exactly green means. Although we have uh, the definition by Security and Exchange Board of India, and there are uh, green guidelines, green bond guidelines by RBI when government of India issued uh, sovereign bond, green bonds also. But there is a possibility that the government may announce more incentives, particularly providing subsidized interest rate uh, for the for the green sector. Uh, in addition to that, uh, there is also a capital outlay of 35,000 crores, particularly from Ministry of Petroleum. Uh, that is, although they're saying that it is for green transition and energy security, it's not clear actually whether it is transition to green or it's just for energy security because we are heavily importing fossil fuel from, from other countries. So that's the reason India would, would like to reduce uh, energy import, particularly natural gas. So we would like to see that how the green transition is happening. Because currently, natural gas is still considered to be green compared to, to, to other fossil fuel sector like oil or, or coal. So that's also particularly the European Union. They, they, by definition, they consider natural gas is green. Uh, I mean, I don't understand what's the reason because uh, the amount of methane natural gas emit, it, it's, it's too much dangerous, actually, much more dangerous than carbon dioxide. So we need to see. In addition to that, uh, there are some announcements on battery storage, uh, particularly because uh, uh, in order to electrify the vehicle, in order to commercially viable uh, the, the electric vehicle, uh, so the battery storage business should also increase. Con- currently, the battery storage as an independent business is not commercially viable, uh, particularly including the manufacturing sector. Manufacturing a battery is not commercially viable. 
So there are a couple of companies uh, uh, I, I read today. There are only three companies in the world who captures around 40 to 50 percent of total battery storage uh, market share. Uh, so battery storage is a huge, hugely capital capital intensive business, and the margin is extremely low, maybe 10 to 12 percent of margin. And in addition to that, it's not commercially viable. So that's the reason the government has also come out some incentive for battery storage, which will help in reducing uh, the, the battery storage technology. Battery is not only going to be used uh, for the electric vehicle, but also is going to be used for the grid also, for particularly the stabilizing the grid, which is very, very important component. So these are the key components which you have seen in, in the budget. Uh, uh, but unfortunately, some of the activities, the, bar, uh, the budget has not touched upon, uh, particularly reducing uh, the tariff on on, on uh, wind on, on uh, solar PV systems. There is expectation that uh, the tariff would be reduced because what is happening that because of depreciation of Indian rupees, uh, the cost of solar PV systems has increased in India. But at the same time, uh, the tariff, because tariff is determined on a power purchase agreement, the tariff has not realized, not translated into increase in tariff. So the, the renewable energy developer is feeling the pressure. So one of the reasons uh, last year the government of India increased tariff because they wanted to uh, manufacture solar PV systems at a, at a scale here in India to reduce reliance on China because of the geopolitical reason. So there is an expectation that uh, there would be reduction of, uh, of solar PV system tariff, but that didn't happen. Uh, there is also expectation on reducing tariff on electrolyzer because most of the time we are importing electrolyzer rather than manufacturing here. Uh, there is a possibility that the incentives announced for hydrogen sector and a significant portion of will go to, to, to in manufacturing electrolyzer. Uh, as we know that uh, last year, government of India also announced uh, to create a carbon market here in India because there is no functional carbon market here in India. Although uh, there is carbon shares or coal shares here in India, and there is some some trading system in the height uh, in the heart to decarbonize this industry, but not any carbon market here in India. It was announced last year. There is an expectation that uh, the government will come out with some kind of carbon stabilization fund, which is necessary because uh, uh, to stabilize the carbon pricing. Because if the carbon price is too unstable, uh, it will not. It, if it is too unstable, it will not give uh, an incentive uh, to the to, to or to the adoption of low carbon technology. But that did happen. Then another area is the agriculture sector. Uh, here in India, agriculture sector is contributing around 17 to 18 percent of total carbon emission, carbon dioxide equivalent emission. Uh, but then there are no discussion on agriculture sector, uh, particularly from cli climate adaptation point of view. A uh, couple of years back, I think three years back, uh, uh, in the economic survey, it was announced that, uh, it was mentioned very clearly, India's agriculture yield could reduce by 15 to 17%. So it's huge, uh, but it was not discussed in the budget how the, the, the government is going to train the farmers. So what are the climate resilience agriculture practices uh, should come out which will help the farmers in reducing, in, in, in mitigating that kind of risk that was not also announced in the in the budget. And there is no discussion on the climate adaptation also, which is very, very critical. Uh, India being, being is, a, is, a, is one of the most uh, vulnerable countries to climate change risk because we have a long coastline and we are still habited land and agriculture. So unfortunately, there is no discussion on climate adaptation, and there is no separate capital allocation for climate adaptation or so. Uh, so I'll stop here, sir. So I'll come back. Thank you. And thank you. I think uh, the more we look for details, as you rightly said, but but what what do you see, Prime Minister? There is a green agenda which is very much there uh, in the budget, and it synchronizes the India's commitment under the G20 or whatever. Uh, 2030 at climate goals and i think i think that's in the right path and uh, the last year we had some initiatives like pni for battery storage ev sector and this year there are a couple of which you rightly mentioned the promotion of green urbanizations like mangroves along the coast 
and then the green transition uh, as you rightly said rene on renewables alternative energy alternatives natural gas green hydrogen and i i also like this uh, the, the municipal bonds uh, you know the issuances for uh, the by the states so waste management and uh, sanitation i think they are all very uh, interesting trend so that the municipal finance market will develop it is already there but it has not picked up despite despite the smart city initiative so municipals would raise bonds for investment in wastes and uh, sanitations and all of them i think there are good trends in this budget uh, thank you lavanaji uh, thank you very much i think now we revert to uh, saibal for uh, for what what have you got us for the equity market everyone is waiting for it <coughs> Hi, good afternoon to all. Um, it's been a pleasure to. And, and by the way, the Saival is also an expert in the insurance sector, and uh, he works. Uh, so he would combine his entire analysis for the equity as well as the insurance, uh, the, the exemptions which was which has been taken away, and many other things there. That market. Thank you. No, no, I will keep it very short. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, because uh, when we are in the business of making money, they say that make money don't talk. So, so I'll not talk much. Uh, the only thing what I'll do is uh, because there are many students here, so I'll uh, put you the perspective, put into perspective the fund manager's view uh, when it comes to uh, budget and all, uh, and also uh, the theme which you have kept for this conference. I think first of all, uh, uh, you know, budget is as it's it's practically a non-event. I mean, we it's overhyped, but it's 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 not a big deal for. Uh, I mean, for the institutional investor as such. Um, and also we are not, as a fund manager, our mandate is not to evaluate budget, whether budget is good, bad. You know, our uh, mandate is to make money, no matter whatever comes. So from that point of view, uh, this budget, I would also rate more as a neutral and direction is on the right path, which market has always expected. Let me give you a little bit of big picture perspective, what budget has not done which I think Rajni has covered to some extent. One is, of course, uh, there is no capital gain tax. That has been a big relief. And also, um, also another silent thing which is happening is that the corporate tax rate has been kept where it has been for quite some time now. And that's a very, very uh, important thing because when uh, while we invest uh, on, uh, in, in India, but then uh, very closely because our global counterparts are uh, registered here as foreign institutional investors. So we are very closely working with them. And one conversation which we used to have seven, 10 years back, that India's PNL, Indian company's PNL is uh, inferior to the global standard PNL uh, because of two particular factors. One is very high interest rates and very high corporate tax rates. And I think in 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 both these factors now uh, quite a bit of significant uh, corrections have happened, and I think directionally we are getting into the global standard in terms of interest rate component, as well as the uh, corporate tax rate. And now since they are not touching it, there is a visibility of corporate tax rate being here, and that's what the analyst can factor in for next five, seven, ten years, which is a it's a very very welcome change from a global fund man fund manager's perspective. And, uh, you know, I think that is one, one very important thing happened. And I think we welcome that uh, from the fund management industry. Uh, very talked about CapEx, 33% growth. Uh, there's a CapEx push for sure. But it's already in the price of the companies which are in capital goods sector, mostly, barring one or two stocks. Most of the stocks have been there because market can't wait for these uh, numbers and data and the announcement to come. They have to make money much before that. Market was anticipating this. As a result, we have seen quite a huge growth on CapEx side. Bit of a disappointment on rural push because uh, which I'm sure my uh, economic count uh, peers will, will agree that there has been a bit of a struggle there. We expected some kind of a rural push will happen, but given the expenditure uh, uh, you know, ex ex excluding interest and subsidies are hardly going to go up and not much on the rural employment generation scheme being allocated. So I think that rural push is missing a little bit. That is paid off for disappointments, but but that's all right. The MSME uh, push and all the stuff is already there in the in the, in the in the NBFC and and bank stocks. So that's that's much there. Um, 
Rest, I would say that uh, and another welcome thing, which I think Devopam covered is on the uh, pharma sector. Uh, somebody has spoken about that. Um, the kind of money, uh, the kind of push on the R&D sectors and all the stuff, which is a very, very welcome move because whenever it comes to a critical drug, either we have to go to a Pfizer or or, or a Merck or, or uh, Abbott and, you know, all those kind of a stuff, all those multinational companies. So from that point of view, uh, this kind of uh, directionally, it is it is absolutely right. Um, what else? I think uh, I think largely the market is neutral as far as the equity market is concerned. Uh, on the fixed income side, yes, I think uh, the government's commitment to get to four and a half percent GDP by 2026, which they committed, uh, directionally it is on the right path. That's a that's a great comfort for the bond market. And uh, the bond has also expected the kind of supply which has been indicated in the in the budget. Uh, there may be a little steepening on the long bond yield. That's because of the insurance demand may come down over a period of time because of tax exemption being withdrawn on the traditional products. Um, that is a little surprising. And let me give you a little perspective here, because uh, you know, uh, I mean, as an as an insurance industry. Uh, Representative, of course, it's disappointing for us. But from a little a bigger picture point of view, this is, of course, an avenue through which you are incentivizing long-term investment by people. And when the money comes to the insurance fund managers, they they generally buy long bonds, which are 10-year, 15-year, 20-year maturity. And beyond 15-year maturity, the only supplies are from government securities or the government bonds, right? Now, if you see the outstanding government securities in India, and if you see the residual maturity uh, of government securities more than 10 years, it is one of the highest in India in terms of the percentage of the total outstanding government securities today. So what it means that supply of long bonds in India is very, very high compared to any, any standard globally. And uh, one of the major reasons that we were seeing that there is a resilience in long bond curve is one of the reason being there's a huge demand from the insurance sector. And if you see that in last one and a half years, or one year rather from last April, uh, the, 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 uh, the policy rate has gone up by 225 basis points, but you see that long bond has been extremely resilient. I think that resilience may go off because demand will, will uh, win out a little bit. Uh, but how much that, that thing will translate, I, I don't know. So to that extent, a little negative, but yeah, over a period of time, things settles down. Um, so largely, I think that is where I will stop. Uh, rather, I'll, I'll answer any question you have on the market. As I said, we don't talk much. We should not. No, I think you you made a very significant uh, point, and I particularly that the long bond uh, of the because that that's the segment which typically the insurance companies only subscribes. And uh, that's not the cup of tea of banks or any other investors. And this might pull away some money, but but on a bigger and larger issue, which if I ask you, Saibal, mm -hmm. you see, uh, this is the trend that uh, the government, for example, the, the tax savings kind of adjustment took place last year also, Provident Fund and ULIF. And now it is coming to insurance for the large amount. So it's not, that's actually not completely withdrawn, but it's for the large amount. Uh, so therefore, uh, and now they bring in the taxation of the market linked debentures, uh, which has come in. And would it not bring a kind of standardization and level playing field of the other segments? Yeah, uh, you know? yeah, yeah, it will. It will. In fact, uh, the, the, the reason is that now the insurance industry is also representing that give us a, this indexation benefit if you are yes, withdrawing, yes. withdrawing the, uh, this, this tax. So, you know, ultimately it will be a level playing field. See, from government's point of view, they don't want to push insurance uh, product as a savings product. They are saying that you sell protection. So that's what you are meant for, right? And uh, and I think they are going in, in that path and there's nothing wrong. The and, market and for the small, uh, you know, below, I think five lakh, right? no, whatever the amount. Yeah, yeah. That, yeah. that is in any case existing. That is in any case will be there. Uh, so the micro insurance, small insurance or households and all, I think they, they are exempted from that. Yeah, only disappointing is for HNIs like you, sir, that you will not get the exemption of five. No, so you you are counting on I I should be on the street sooner. Don't worry. 
I think Devapom mentioned about uh, Gokhale Institute where I am also a student of that institute, joined, was a student in 1983. And uh, I'm glad that uh, we are the same uh, students of the same institute. Thank you. I think uh, from uh, there are many we could speak, but students want to participate and given the shortage of time. So let me uh, hand over to the students to have their questions and then we will come back with our own points uh, after this round. Thank you, over to you. Yeah, hi, sir. Uh, thank you for giving the opportunity. Uh, so there are many questions coming because we are live on Inside IM page also. So one of the question is uh, regarding the exports. So, uh, uh, like, uh, you know, we are broadly doing around $650 billion of exports a year and services is almost like $200 billion. Rest of that is the merchandise goods. Uh, services is already growing in double digits, right? And, uh, but uh, now the government is also fo focusing for manufacturing exports to grow in double digit so that we can broadly reach $1 trillion target in terms of exports. So how do you see uh, exports panning out in the near term and how will it impact the financial markets, uh, you know, and uh, some of the beneficiary sector uh, in terms of exports, uh, if you can focus at. You could say, whom are you asking that question? Uh, Sir, so this is open for everybody. This is open for all questions. I think uh, more qualified will be Rajni and uh, Debopam to answer this because. Yeah, I'll take that question and Debopam, please add to it. Um, so, uh, Mr. Pradhan, you just mentioned that I was sounding very positive. So now this is the time when I can sound a little negative now. So uh, exports is something which I would be concerned about at this point in time. And uh, that's got to do with this global slowdown that we are talking about. You know, we are talking about uh, most of the developed economies going through a major slowdown, if not a recession. So that is going to have an impact on our exports. And we are, so overall, you know, um, overall the trade data is projected to slow down in uh, 2023. So we are expecting our exports to also moderate in uh, FI24. So uh, in the near term, yes, there are concerns on exports. So all the segments, you know, uh, highly export uh, dependent sectors like uh, gems and jewelry, leather, handicraft. We are actually, if you look at the data for the last few months, we are already seeing contraction in most of the export segment, except for electronics, which is recording good growth. For most of the segments, we have already started seeing a contraction. So that would be a concern area. Here, I would like to highlight that in a scenario where we are expecting exports to slow down, most of our export sectors are also highly labor intensive. So that means, and they are also, you know, if I talk about textiles and leather and handicap, these are also, you know, large participation is from the MSME segment. So with external slowdown happening, these segments would get impacted. So hence, you know, uh, employment, labor absorption by these segments would get impacted. And hence, to that extent, it would impact consumption also in the economy. So uh, that is a concern area for near term. But if you ask me about a little longer term, what we need to do to increase our exports to some of the numbers that you were uh, talking about, if we really want to meaningfully increase our exports number for where we are currently, I think what is going to help is that, uh, as you all would be aware, that India is in talks with a lot of countries for uh, trade agreements. So I think, you know, so far, if we look at our experience with trade agreements, we have not been, uh, we have not seen very positive results from the trade agreements that we have signed in the past, because of which India had got very cautious and wary of signing uh, trade agreements. And probably that would explain why we had stepped out of RCEP also. But I think with, you know, us looking at it again and uh, with all these conversations that we're having with many of the countries, including EU, UK, Australia on free trade agreements, I think if these are signed on, uh, on terms which are favorable for us, then this is a big way in which we could benefit because this will provide us a lot of, you know, external markets which will help our exports grow. 
so one that second uh, you know a lot of measures which have been announced in the last few years and a lot more is required is in terms of ease of doing business and in terms you know what are we doing to attract other countries fdi into india to manufacture if you are talking about china plus one strategy this is a good opportunity so yes we had a pli scheme but what more are we doing on that front what more are we doing in terms of improving the ease of doing business further so that the more of manufacturing is happening here and at the same time we sign up with this trade agreement so that we have not just the domestic market available we also have the external market available to give a big push to our exports so i think that's what is required to give a meaningful push to our exports market uh, got it ma'am so i think uh, the more of uh, free trade agreements and Uh, some more policy changes on international relations front uh, would probably help the uh, exports as a whole. Can I add uh, one? Can I? Yes, add? sir. Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, I, I just uh, trying to add that there has been buzzwords on two concepts which are going around. One is this China plus one. You know, there's a lot of countries uh, which have the uh, manufacturing base or activities in China. i think they are looking for china plus one more country in the region i think india becomes definitely the alternative and and the next the us uh, treasury secretary recently coined this word called uh, french shoring or ally shoring you know french shoring basically is a strategy where uh, you know you source things or or components or manufacture goods uh, from uh, with countries where you have a shared values or or, or kind of Uh, said, uh, you know, the allies in geopolitical stress. Uh, so therefore, the India, I suppose, has uh, quite a bit of. Uh, uh, so I think if I, I'm not sure how these two forces are going to align, and, uh, and then bring in some business to India, uh, possibly. Uh, so I think this talks to what Rajini exactly said. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, uh, sir, my, my next question is to uh, uh, Sai Bal Sir. Uh, so uh, one of the arguments often foreign investors and uh, uh, people uh, institutional investors in particular make that india is not a cheap market right so we always we uh, relative to other uh, 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 large economies we are always trading at a premium uh, kind of a valuation uh, so do you think that in medium term in uh, maybe 3 to 5 years uh, horizon when we become as we become from 3 and a half trillion to 5 trillion dollar economy we can continue uh, trading at a premium to all the other major uh, economies and uh, the one extension to that question is what do you think uh, are the major risks and challenges that can spoil the party for the capital market participants i think uh, you know today if you see the market valuation at 19 times it's it's just 10% above the uh, uh, long term average so from that point of view it is little expensive but it is not too much expensive and especially when you are at the cusp of uh, multi year growth in, in i mean if that's what we believe then at the beginning of the cycle the multiples are generally on a higher side so that that's that's nothing wrong in it the only point is that from a foreign institutional investors point of view uh, india has far outperformed the emerging market index last year uh, in the last one and a half years rather and now since china is opening up uh, which may delay one or two months here and there but if you see that the uh, lot of money is now going to other emerging market uh, uh, including china uh, not that they are taking out money big time from india but the fresh allocations are largely going there and uh, in this calendar year generally you see the fii trend on a calendar year basis uh, in last one and a half months or so uh, you will see that uh, india has started underperforming the emerging market index uh, quite significantly and this may continue for a year but that's not a, a big deal over a, over a longer period of time what i'm hearing uh, in the global forum uh, india is definitely a sweet spot the only problem with india is that our market cap is very small compared to the global uh, fund managers because india is still a small cap stock for them if they want to invest a big money uh, the indian market still can't absorb so from that point of view uh, there is there is a little bit of uh, negativity but 
as we are growing and from that point of view only i can say that i think the market is there for a multiple year bull run you take out 20 years uh, return of a benchmark you will see largely and as uh, professor pradhan has also said that when you regress equity market with <clears throat> the equity growth uh, market growth, nominal gdp growth you see a very perfect correlation and i think that's that causality is here as well uh, we are seeing that the market has given 11, 12, 13% kind of a growth, which has been largely the nominal GDP growth for the country. This is going to continue. And I think uh, Dr. Shukla was mentioning this thing in the in the last panel, that uh, rule of 72 and all the stuff. Uh, I mean, you see that in the next six years, we will we'll be double than what we are today uh, in terms of our size. And market will largely uh, reflect that in terms of the market cap. So yes, I think we are we are heading for. Uh, I firmly believe in India's story, because from 2014 onwards, there has been quite a bit of reform which has taken place, uh, except in something in land and labor, maybe more to do. But otherwise, a lot of reforms have taken place. Uh, they are in the right place at this point of time. The intention of the government is good. It's a it's a it's a it's a uh, st politically stable uh, democratic country. English-speaking country, young population. So all the stuff is, is, is are there. Nothing has changed. Only thing where I think we should be very careful, uh, which Rajini has also mentioned, is inflation. Because we have to keep inflation under control. In a very simple term, if your inflation is higher than the rest of the globe, you are becoming poorer. Uh, and that may reflect through your currency. So every time the snake comes into our uh, house, it 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 came through uh, largely through currency markets. You have to be careful, keep the inflation under control, um, and then I think we'll be there. And now, what should be the inflation rate? Uh, that is something which the economist can can tell you the optimal inflation rate. But yeah, if we keep that thing in mind, we are there. Yes, sir. Indeed, sir, uh, nominal GDP growth and both the financial markets going in uh, early teens and that would uh, definitely unlock massive wealth creation opportunity to both the corporate India and the you know retail investors like us. Uh, so, sir, uh, just for the positive of time, I'll uh, ask the last question to uh, Lavanya, sir. Uh, which is related to the trend in the green bonds. So recently, uh, the government uh, raised around 8,000 crores uh, by raising money through green bonds. And, uh, you know, uh, so that trend is, uh, that is the one of the trend which is emerging uh, across the financial markets, the ESG investing. And the government is also trying to raise uh, money through green bonds and even the corporate India. And they want to put that money into sustainability related projects. So what's your take on that and how do you see that panning out? So uh, in near term uh, to medium term. Uh, actually, if you see the non-sovereign green bonds uh, uh, raised in India, it's around $25 billion. So uh, when it has been in time, I think the past green bond is to in India seven, eight years back. So that's not a new thing. The, the critical point is that when the green bond size was very small, so that was a green bond premium because it was giving incentives to the borrower uh, to issue green bonds because uh, they were getting a premium. They were able to raise capital at a lower cost. But unfortunately, that premium is shrinking over a period of time uh, because there are too much supply of green bonds in the market and there are not enough demand because uh, initially, the investors whose mandate was not only financially done, but also non-financial returns, they were buying that bond at a at a premium price. And there are not enough green bonds were available. So that was the reason why there was a green bond premium in the market. But that premium is no more. It, it's gone actually. If you there are some empirical reports who suggest that the green bond premium is only two to three basis points or main, uh, maybe five basis points. Uh, even if uh, finance ministry uh, seven, eight months back, when they announced that we are going to, to issue public green bonds. We were expecting maybe 30, 40 basis points. Uh, but that didn't happen actually. The green bond premium is only five to seven, five to seven basis points they got. Uh, we need to remember that there is also additional cost when you are raising green bonds, additional cost in the in the case of second party opinion, because you need to hire a second party opinion. So you have to pay for that. And you need third party opinion also, because basically who will monitor whether the proceeds of the bond are really used in green assets. There is additional cost for the borrower. Uh, as for my conversation with some of the borrowers here in India, they are saying 
why should we issue green bonds unless we get some premium unless our cost of debt is low so there is no premium available to them uh, so that's the reason the borrowers are not really uh, satisfied with with, with green bonds to show i don't see actually in the future although i mean the corporate they are raising green bonds just for the pr exercise because they would like to see as, as they are helping in climate actions uh, and they would like investors to see that okay they are doing something for the for the for the art for sure but that's not the story even some of the uh, empirical research published by bis they suggest that the companies who have issued green bonds uh, actually a, a small percentage of, green, of 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 their portfolio is actually green and a large percentage of their portfolio is actually not green they are not really helping in climate action so there is a lot of uh, i mean say concern uh, among the investors also whether uh, the, the the corporates are really doing something or just raising green bonds to, to to improve their their green credibility uh, i i don't think that green bond will play a very very important role unless the, there is a clear distinction between a green bonds and conventional bonds also because it's it's becoming much more clear over a period of time what is green what is non green once the definition is comes out very cleanly you will see that corporate will issue green bonds but i don't think that they will get any premium to issue green bonds so those that's the area of concern uh, yeah. but to incentivize them there is a possibility that uh, the government may come out uh, giving some incentive for example there is a discussion going on whether uh, whether green, only green bonds can be considered as a collateral by central bank okay so although uh, here in india uh, reserve bank of india doesn't consider the corporate bond as collateral but in de- developed country there is a lot of discussion going on so they are uh, thinking to give some kind of incentive so that they can issue green bonds but from the market perspective from purely commercial perspective i don't think that you will see a lot large amount of capital issued uh, to green bonds similarly we saw in esg funds also So yeah. there is there is no ESG fund launch here in India in last eight to ten twelve months. Nothing. Yes, a lot of issues needs to be tackled before we go ahead with the you know becoming just green. Just to allow me, green. just to allow me to make one comment on Lavanya. I think this green culture is yet to develop. Green portfolios are yet to be you know by institutional investors are yet to be maybe are not yet developed. that consciousness and the regulatory side also the green uh, initiatives are also slowly emerging even fund houses even though they have green funds it is very difficult to distinguish whether a green fund is doing better than, than the normal funds so i think this greening uh, init culture is now emerging and i hope will gain momentum but there are good beginnings in india yes. thanks thank you so, uh, so i mean rbi actually the borbans came out with a consultation paper on climate and sustainability uh, if you see actually the slew of recommendations on the rbi is currently contemplating uh, so you will see in next the next 5 to 7 years that the particularly the regulated entities both commercial banks nbfcs and mfi they are going to implement it huge actually so i mean i believe that it will be implemented over a period of time uh, but it, it will start from the large bank because rbi is following uh, the global standard uh, currently rbi is a member of something called ngfs network for greening finance system where you will see around 27 27 27 28 countries who are currently the member including the rbi rbi mem- became a member of that ngfc in 2021 after that there is a lot of guidelines or a lot of comments coming from the rbi So at such a definitely there is a lot of momentum coming from the regulator side. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much for your perspective. Uh, I think we'll open a uh, open Q and A for the attendees. So if someone in the uh, any attendees, if you want to uh, ask questions, so they can raise their hands and they can ask it to panel members. Yeah, so I have a question uh, to Sabal sir. So since you are since you are in the business of money making, right? Gives us gives us a tips of you know uh, multiplying our small savings into you know um, multi millions so that we also become an H and I like you and perhaps <laughs> considering the current budget. So invest in long term. That's the only thing. 
uh, you know, any time you want to invest in the market, it's a good time as long as it is for a long time. So please stay invested um, and don't buy something which you don't understand. I think that's all. Nothing beyond that. There's no magic sauce. Yeah, thank you, sir. Uh, yes, Monica, you can go ahead. Yeah. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon to all the panelists. Uh, it's it was one uh, wonderful experience in uh, experiencing this uh, budget decoding. Uh, my question is like it is also related to green initiative uh, that we are towards a green India. Uh, Lavinia, sir, if you can uh, just give your perspective over uh, this, uh, there is a provision of uh, four um, it's, uh Remedy of uh, green hydrogen by 2030 with an investment of 19,700 crores. So, how is like India uh, encompassing this in this uh, particular uh, decade, upcoming decade, where we are going to uh, encompass the entire initiatives ahead? Uh, hydrogen actually will play and play, play a very important role in in two in in couple of sectors, particularly in the long transportation like shipping industry airlines and trucks because in this kind of industry you cannot use battery because battery by nature it's very heavy and its energy intensity is very low compared to hydrogen so you cannot rely on on, on, on battery for long distance travel like shipping airlines or or or, or, or trucks or so so you will see the application of back of application of hydrogen in this three sector in addition to that, there are other hard to decarbonize industries like cement, uh, steel, and iron, and petrochemicals, and and, and uh, uh, this kind of industries. So you will see uh, the heat contents. You cannot electrify this kind of industries just by uh, switching to renewable energy. You are not going to help uh, to these industries because these industries and they need the structure of industry such that uh, the heat content should be very very high. So hydrogen can can solve that particular purpose. And number three is that uh, you need uh, you you need to manufacture fertilizers here in India. For example, through 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 green hydrogen, you can also to derive fertilizers which are we are currently Im uh, importing like ammonia also, which can be used in the in the fertilizer manufacturing here in India. I think the government of India is currently trying uh, to reduce uh, the cost of electrolyzer, which is an important component of, of, of green hydrogen because we have already seen uh, the renewable energy price it's already crashed so you need to store that renewable energy somewhere and in the case of uh, hydrogen green hydrogen so once you cut down uh, the cost of electrolyzer significantly so there is a possibility that you can cut down the cost of storage basically green hydrogen nothing but it will store the electricity the green electricity somewhere and you can use in multiple applications also. So once you cut down the cost of electrolyzer by scaling up, I believe that uh, the, the money will be will, will be used for manufacturing electrolyzer because there are some of the companies like Reliance or Adani, they are also planning to, to start, uh, yeah, start investing heavily in electrolyzer manufacturing. So that's the plan, I believe, once uh, the cost of electrolyzer decreases significantly, you will see that there is a number of applications uh, of, of, of green hydrogen also. Yes, uh, it's, it's like a very uh, overthrow throughout the manufacturing industry. Um, thank, thanks for the perspective, sir. It's uh, already all the, means the manufacturing industries have put forward. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, sir, I think we'll take the last question and then we'll close the session. So I think Mehulji has some. Uh, uh, sir, good afternoon, everyone. I have one question, uh, especially like, you know, when we are talking of uh, the lot of capital expenditure happening, I mean, the capital expenditure greater than the revenue expenditure, and the government is focusing more on this. 
but uh, and 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 at the same time we see the private uh, capacities are touching around 70 to 75% so i mean they are almost at the highest uh, uh, rating that's what i i hear so is it like you know like and this especially this is the question for uh, rajni ma'am and devu pam sir uh, regarding like you know how do you see the private investments like you know when the government expenditure is growing is it like you know that the private uh, expenditure or the corporate expenditure is also growing in sync in terms of adding more capacity especially in the context of the rising interest rate and like you know do you see anything in the credit uptake uh, and and what's your view on on this because i have been seeing that uh, the private investments uh, the corporate investments are a little bit skeptical and they sometimes keep on delaying and i don't see much of the investment which has come in uh, in the last couple of years so uh, the, so the view uh, from your side ma'am and sir If we uh, look at the uh, private sector capex, as you said, they have been hesitant to kickstart the capex cycle. Uh, if we look at actually, if we look at the backdrop, uh, there has been deleveraging that has happened by the corporate sector in the last few years. Like you mentioned, capacity utilization levels are at that app level seventy four or so, where you know now investment should start happening. But on a big scale, we are not seeing that as yet. but yes some beginning has started happening on that front few of the parameters that we look at like uh, so we track this data on new investment proposal which gives an indication of what is the intent by uh, the corporate sector to invest it may not result in actual investment but what's the intent to invest and there again we are seeing some strong pick up in the last two quarters but broadly uh, yes you're right the private sector is hesitant given the whole uncertainties around us in terms of you know global situation what is going to pan out what's going to be the impact of that on indian economy so in this kind of uncertain scenario we are seeing private sector being hesitant but i feel and you know then there's this also this debate going on that government has been doing capex for the last 2 years on expectation that they will crowd in private investment but that's not really happening so that is one concern but i think uh, you know with uh, this whole backdrop of capacity utilization level also increasing and then commodity prices have also gone down so input prices have gone down in the last few months so i think uh, the environment is conducive for uh, private sector capex to pick up we are seeing some signs and going forward we could see a pick up in capex cycle happening from the private sector we may not see a very strong pick up given that you know the whole environment is going to remain a little uncertain going forward also because while for india we are talking about around 6% growth let's not forget that globally we are talking about slowdown we are concerned about recession and all that is going to have an adverse impact on business sentiments in india too so i think private sector would be a uh, skeptical but yes uh, some pick up i do expect from here on private capex just if i may add a couple of things to what uh, rajni just mentioned mehul ji you know from a philosophical point of view in economics when we study economics and pradhan sir will agree there is this production function and this production function is dependent on two variables of production largely one is labor and the other one is capital that's a very simplified world but yeah this is how it is now labor in a country like india is not a problem we know how many management students graduate every year so are engineers so and every, every other stream of uh, education that that is out there but capital has always been a challenge okay and this is the reason you see cap private capex keep on faltering no matter how much uh, push the government tries to give to it the crowding in concept is something that i have been hearing for a lot of time i have not re really you know seen it take off and and it it did take off towards the you know early 2000s but then it came down with the crash of rising npas so it was obviously not managed well so in a country like india unlike what macro textbooks teach us which is the paradox of thrift which means that if you don't if you don't spend your economy slows down and your income slows down your nation's income slows down that's that's something which is true for the american uh, cases right that's that's not true for india in india we need a population to be lot more thrifty and the money that we save as a population is the money which will the private capex 
because this is not significantly available india also there are many other reasons but this is one of the critical reasons why india is still a country with huge borrowing costs we need a lot of capital there's a lot of infrastructure yet to be done private sector has to play a significant role but where is the money the money is so expensive so that is one of the major impediment for private sector capex to pick up and some of the leakages that comes to my mind in order why this is happening one as i mentioned the savings rate in the economy is low and it has been shrinking as what the newspaper articles uh, that you might have been referring to are all suggesting over the last two three years so currently the credit deposit ratio of banks uh, is all, all all of these type of banks be it the psu banks or the private banks are more than 100 percent so they are giving credit uh you know out of thin air literally not from their deposit pool so this is building pressure on borrowing costs as i mentioned the other type of leakage is the poor financial inclusion you know msme uh, has very you know the, the access to credit they have is very very restricted that's the point uh, i made and professor also echoed and during the first uh, you know stage of my discussion and and nbfc is where you know doing a good job till ilfs happened and after ilfs nbfcs have also you know moved out of that market uh, to a great extent there was one point of time when 60 percent of the new loan which was being given to msmes were being originated by nbfcs no that's no longer the case and msmes are left to themselves uh, only with the little government support that is coming their way right now the next leakage which is preventing capex is you know banks themselves have been shying away from long duration corporate loans back in 2015-16 before the asset quality review happened and the entire npa problem cropped up retail loans which is the loans that you and i get for buying televisions cars homes etc used to be about 20 percent of the of the banking loan book today it has grown, grown up to 30 percent at the cost of corporate loans because banks are now taking comfort with the relative safety of retail loans because you and i are you know will be forced to pay back which many of the corporates did not earlier and which led to the rise of the npa debacle that happened in india some of the banks are still yet to come out of it so that's that that's the the third leakage which is causing the problem and the, another leakage is the fourth leakage is you know absence of specialized institutions which can lend for long gestation uh, infrastructure projects pehle icici karti thi but then icici became a bank then banks also then started to favor retail loans rather than long term loans and now india doesn't have a specialized institution focusing only on long, long gestation you know infrastructural projects nafit has been set up all, it's going through its own challenges it's going to take some time to gather momentum but till then you know we we don't have any such specialized institution and finally the last leakage which is preventing capex to come big time into the market is in the absence of bank loans there is very limited alternate opportunities for a corporate to raise fund the other only opportunity for a corporate is to go to the bond market and in the bond market, either you go to the foreign bond market or the Indian bond market. Now, the foreign bond market is out of reach of most of these MSMEs and the small corporates. They cannot handle it, right? With all the RBI regulations and the, and the fundraising events that needs to be done, so on and so forth. They're expensive and difficult. And a lot of compliance restrictions are there. So that, that boils down to the alternate being the domestic bond market. And to put things in a very, for the sake of simplicity, although please don't quote me for this, you know, if I have to draw analogies, while Indian Railways is moving at a super fast towards super fast Bande Bharat, corporate bond market is still operating like a narrow gate, short haul local train. That's the situation in India. No matter how many steps that have been taken, this is where we are right now. So these are some of the problems. The fixes are easy, but it needs a lot of strong political and corporate will to, you know, tide over them. Banks have to participate wholeheartedly. Securitization as a project needs to be taken up. Uh, securitization can free up a lot of capital, bank capital. So there are ways, there are obviously, and some of them have been discussed in the previous panel I was hearing in the last phase. But yeah, so these are some of the issues which is preventing private capital. So thank you, sir. It gives a lot of information. So ultimately, it is going to take a while to get all these things done for the private investment. So we'll have to stick to the government expenditure for now. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you all. It was a wonderful discussion. Uh, uh, sorry to intervene, sir. If you and the panel allowed, then I have one curiosity. So can I ask, sir, for a few minutes, sir? One minute, last. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Seriously. Uh, uh, sir, uh, in the discussion, we heard that about the budget that uh, it's covered the increasing the capital spending with 33% and slashing 
uh, the income tax and yet reducing the physical deficit. But uh, my question is to the both uh, economics, sir and ma'am. Uh, ma'am, if you uh, see, then you can find out the uh, ratio uh, of the country's interest payment uh, to the total revenue uh, was 37% uh, in 2021 22 and 40% uh, in 2022 uh, 23 also. Uh, uh, yeah, we have a very well system, and now we uh, work on that uh, income tax rate have increased manifold also. But uh, uh, all tax revenue will be shallowed uh, by the interest payment. Uh, and even India, too, uh, we have abandoned the physical responsibility and budget management act uh, that is uh, the target of 3% of GDP. So, uh, uh, is it a, a good sign for us, or uh, uh, how you react on the long term basis, sir? So, uh, Sushant, you're right on that. Our uh, interest payment uh, accounts for a large percentage of our total expenditure. And uh, so, th see, what has also happened is that during the pandemic, the fiscal deficit had shot up sharply because of which the government debt has gone up. And hence, going forward, we are going to go through this phase where, so of the total revenue expenditure, around 30% is going in uh, interest payment. So the, we are going to go through this phase, through this pain for some years to come. In fact, for the uh, central government, general government debt to go back to pre-pandemic level, as per our uh, calculation, it's going to take five to six years. So this pain of high interest expenditure is going to be there. So um, we cannot do anything about that. The point is that how are we balancing other aspects? So what are we cutting down on? Because interest payment is something which we have to, you know, we have that commitment. So in that sense, uh, you know, this uh, I think the FM has done a good balancing act of going ahead with CAPEX, with a good growth on CAPEX, even while these commitments on revenue expenditure were there. So the way they have achieved it this year, the way they have managed to achieve it is through reduction in subsidy. Both food and fertilizer subsidy has been cut this year, which has given provided a cushion. But yes, yes then the concern is that uh, we don't know how the year will play out in terms of, you know, a lot of global uncertainties um, are still there. So we really don't know if there will be need of more fertilizer subsidy than what had been budgeted for. Uh, will, will there be more need for food, food subsidy than what has been budgeted for? But right now, the way uh, the government has managed it is by cutting on uh, uh, subsidies and hence managing to have that interest expenditure and continue with the focus on KPEX. The other thing that they have also cut on, like we uh, discussed earlier, the revenue expenditure growth is pretty low at some, you know, less than 2% or so. So some of these schemes that if you look at, uh, like, uh, you know, uh, uh, Saibal, uh, initially you had spoken about lesser focus on uh, rural schemes, some of the rural schemes. So yes, that has happened. If we look at the allocation for uh, rural sector, there has been a there has been a very marginal growth, or I think a reduction, and that has mainly happened because the allocation to Manrega, the rural the employment guarantee scheme, that has been uh, reduced. But, you know, if you look at that, that's something which anyways, we have seen that during the year, as per the requirement, government increases the allocation to the scheme. And also not to forget that during the pandemic, the allocation to Manrega had shot up very sharply the two years. So probably with things returning to normalcy, again, the allocation to that scheme has reduced. And also to, you know, another point I'll highlight is that the uh, if you look at the data on uh, job demanded under a Manrega scheme in rural areas, that has been going down, which is a positive signal, which indicates that the uh, job requirement, dependence on the scheme is reducing. Other job opportunities are coming up. So I think government right now has balanced it by, you know, cutting expenses wherever they felt at this time it's possible. Going forward, they may have to breach some of these expenses. Uh, but right now, this is how they have balanced it. I think uh, 
ma'am, that answers his uh, all of the questions. And uh, I think we have already overshot the time, so we'll just uh, close the session by Adaka. Right. <clears throat> Thank you very much, everybody. Hello, everyone. I would like to take this opportunity to thank our program directors, Professor H.K. Pradhan, sir, and Professor N. Shivshankaran, sir, for giving us the opportunity to conduct this event and for providing us with all the support needed to make this event a successful one. I would also like to thank our honorable panelists, Ms. Rajani Sinha, Mr. Debupan Chaudhary, Mr. Labanya Prakash Jena, and Mr. Saibal Ghosh for taking your time out on a Sunday and giving us this enriching experience and sharing your knowledge with us, and for patiently answering all our questions and clarifications. We feel privileged and grateful to have an opportunity to interact with such distinguished minds. Next, I would like to thank all the participants from XLRI as well as other students and working professionals who have joined us today via Zoom, LinkedIn Live and YouTube Live. Your encouragement and participation has made this event very successful. Finally, I would like to thank our internal team members from PGDF, FINAX Committee, XOL Placement Committee, and our sponsors inside IIM for, work, for working with each other harmoniously from these past few weeks towards executing the first ever discussion on the Union Budget 2023, Decoding Budget and Beyond. Thank you all for joining us today and hope you have a great Sunday. Thank you all. Thank you from me. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir.